I guess like spirit of the water. Maybe the person can be relatively invisible and then it can flow over to heal that other person that's like in the water. Mm. Or we'll like just follow you. We'll just follow yeah, you. Don't, okay. don't we find that like because if we're if we're all different yeah, from each that's other, that's true. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
see, check one, see, check, hey, hey. Your and we'll find um but we'll be able to see you yeah, yeah well that's fine I, mean, I don't know how far down i'll be here but like yeah we'll always the fire is going to be yeah we'll we're going to do the yeah, fire we'll sort of one on the floor and one on the riser and then stuff like this and stuff like so i think that's fine okay but will the steps work if the piano is on If you if you wanted to do a little sound check too, you're more than welcome to do that now. Yeah, we'll just be. There will be mountains that I will have to climb, and there will be battles that I will have to fight, but victory or defeat, it's up to me to decide, but how can I expect to win? If I never try, oh. Where's the first time you, um, is that good out there? Great, sounds great, thank you. Um, where's the first time you all are like, singing together, getting harmonies? Uh, right next, right there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't give. I just can't give up now. Ooh. I've come too far from where I started from. Nobody told me the road would be easy, and I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me. I'm sure you could hear yourself in this room, but let me know how it feels. Yeah. 
Yeah, no key changer. No, you didn't bring me out here to leave me lonely. And even when I can't see clearly, I know that you are with me so I can.
<laughs> Testing one, two, welcome to Sanders Theater.
gentlemen, please find your seats as you enter this theater. Ladies and gentlemen, please find your seats as you enter the theater.
morning, and welcome to Sanders Theater as we honor the moral and intellectual legacy of our friend and teacher, Dr. Paul Farmer. First, many thanks to our quintet, all members of the Harvard community, Dr. Christine Schrock, Ellen Schrock, Dr. Lisa Wong, Grant Rue, and Solon Gordon. We're pleased to share this, that this memorial program is being live streamed and recorded, and we welcome all of our friends from around the world who are unable to be here in person today. At this time, we ask you to turn off your cell phones and pagers, and please refrain from any photography during the memorial program. As you will see, included in your printed program is an insert with helpful information about the schedule of the day and a diagram of Sanders Theater, which notes locations of restrooms and emergency exits. Following the memorial program, we will proceed to Sandra Quad, Seaver Quad in Harvard Yard for lunch. Seaver Quad is a five minute walk from here, and we will have staff along the walking route to guide you. Lunch will be under a tent and protected from the rain. We're asking that all guests return here no later than 12.50 p.m., and the symposium will begin promptly at one. Lastly, upon entry into the theater, you receive the black wristband. This wristband has two purposes, one practical and the other mission-driven. Let's start with the practical. This wristband is your re-entry pass. You will need to show the wristband if you leave the theater during the memorial and to return after, or after to re-enter after the symposium. Second, as many of you know, accompaniment is one of the guiding principles of our work. Paul instilled the notion of accompaniment in all of us. We hope you will wear this wristband in solidarity with one another and our collective commitment to global health equity. And we also hope it will serve as a gentle reminder that you are not alone as we carry forward Paul's legacy in the days, months, and years ahead. Thank you for being here today. President Larry Bacow, Virginia Farmer, D.D. Bertrand Farmer and Family, fellow colleagues, distinguished guests, good morning and welcome to the celebration of the moral and intellectual legacy of Dr. Paul Edward Farmer, distinguished scholar, compassionate physician, and global humanitarian. My name is Emmanuel Echampon, and I'm the Ellen Gerny Professor of History and of African and African American Studies, and the Minister for Worship and Formation at Harvard Memorial Church. This morning's program is a memorial, and a symposium will be held this afternoon in recognition of Paul's intellectual legacy. In March this year, I attended the celebration of life for my friend Paul at Trinity Church in Boston. And in April, I chaired the committee that conducted the 10-year review of the Master of Medical Sciences in Global Health Delivery that Paul established at the Harvard Medical School in 2012. It was humbling and gratifying to hear so many from around the world pay tribute to how their lives had been touched by Paul. Many called Paul friend, but what made me so proud of Paul was that he was a friend to the vulnerable, the helpless, the ill. It is appropriate that we celebrate not only Paul's intellectual, but also his moral legacy. Paul's work was driven by a strong moral compass rooted in his Catholic faith. This was a quiet faith that may not have been made explicit, but it grounded Paul's quest for social justice in a spirituality that lended faith, love, and hope. In the Gospel of Matthew, 
Jesus compared the kingdom of heaven to a mustard seed. In his words, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of seeds. But when it is grown, it is greater than the earth and becomes a tree, so that the birds of the air come and rest in its branches. Paul was a giant tree that grew from a humble seed, and many from around the world, Haiti, Peru, Sierra Leone, Rwanda, Boston, found rest in its branches. We thank God for the gift and the blessing of the life of Paul Edward Farmer. I'm Larry Bacow, and as president, I would like to welcome you all officially to this gathering in memory of our friend, our colleague, and our teacher, Paul Farmer. One of the greatest gifts of the presidency is the gift of knowledge, knowledge of our faculty, knowledge of their work, knowledge of their skill, and knowledge of their impact on the world. Before I met Paul, I had heard all about him. I had read his own writings and those who also wrote about him. But nothing could have prepared me to hear him speak in person. His searing and vivid descriptions of, real uh, of reality his impassioned yet measured aspirations for humanity opened my eyes more fully. His devotion to every person, no matter where they lived, under what circumstances, opened my heart more fully. My time with him was a gift that I will treasure forever. Jewish tradition offers us a beautiful idea. There are, it asserts, in every generation, 36 righteous people. Now, 36 in Hebrew translates as Lamed Vav. Or, another way to think about it in Yiddish, 36 Lamed Vavniks, whose commitment to, justify, to justice and righteousness justifies the existence of the world. These people are not known to us. In fact, they are not known to themselves, which means that any one of us could be one of them. Paul, I believe, was a Lamed Vavnik, a person who walked among us for a time to remind us that none of us travels alone. We proceed through life alongside one another, revealing, witnessing, and practicing humanity on this journey. Every step that we take, every step, as individuals and through the institutions we build and nurture and renew together, can move us, should move us, closer to our ideals. Thank you, Didi, for sharing your husband with the world. Thank you to the children of Paul for sharing your father with the world. We in this room and countless others are all the better for your generosity and for the generosity of the entire Farmer family. May you all find peace in today's embrace of the Harvard community. And may memories of our dear friend and colleague be for you and for all of us and for the entire world a blessing.
Thank you very much. President Bacow, uh, my colleague Emmanuel Champong, Didi, and the entire uh, Farmer family. I'm Arthur Kleinman. The Paul Farmer we are here to memorialize today is a world historic figure. Paul rose to that elevated status because he had become the moral exemplar of medical humanitarianism. For me, as for so many others, Paul was the most admirable of human beings, a constant source of goodness and light centered on healing the sick through partnership and accompaniment with the poor. Paul was all about the audacity of care and caring. Care and love anchored his te teaching, his mentoring, his work as a physician, and his vision for global health care delivery. Care was there in the everyday authenticity of his kindness, his healing presence, his offbeat sense of humor, and his joyful way of being in the world. He drew around him the finest of collaborators, such that he could and did lead the department from wherever he was. He kept us going with absolute ethical clarity that what mattered most is partnership with others to pursue and deliver the resources the sick and oppressed required. To accomplish that, he would take great risks and put himself in real danger. I knew Paul for more than 40 years. I was his PhD supervisor and his department head. He became my teacher my department head. He also became my dearest friend. When Paul, together with Jim Kim, told me in the 1980s that with Ophelia Dahl and others, they planned to create an NGO called Partners in Health, I offered my wise counsel. I told them to first finish their MD PhDs. Fortunately for all of us, they ignored me, as Paul so graciously did, I can tell you many times thereafter. But Paul did finish and caused a minor sensation in the Department of Anthropology when he turned in an 800-page PhD dissertation in two volumes. Paul led with an entirely unorthodox style. In faculty meetings, he literally spent most of the time inquiring how each of us was doing. This barely left time for the agenda, yet somehow the department thrived and we all left those meetings feeling uplifted. Paul's extraordinary effectiveness in crossing between the clinic and the classroom, the boardroom and the village, was because he possessed a unifying vision that brought critical theory and practice together. How many of us can harmonize research originality, inspiring teaching, ethical wisdom, clinical excellence, and epidemic and social health interventions, and do so with the warmest and closest of international friendships that Paul maintained over decades. Few realize, even today, just how prodigious and unified is his intellectual work. He wore his scholarship lightly, but Paul Farmer was a serious social theorist a gifted ethnographer, a deep scholar, a clinical researcher, and a superb writer. Paul exemplified the marriage of service and scholarship. In his writing, grounded in the powerful idea of structural violence, he critically interrogated the cruelties and injustices of social history. He drew from diverse sources, political economy, liberation theology, historical analysis of the slave trade, the colonial roots 
of global health institutions, the social epidemiology of racial disparities, and the histories and ethnographies of the poorest of peoples with whom he worked. But he also drew upon the science and technology of his specialization, infectious diseases, in bringing what he called critical pragmatism and pragmatic solidarity into medical and social interventions and public advocacy. Like the early founders of social science, including such Harvard luminaries as William James and W.E.B. Du Bois, Paul insisted that the purpose of knowledge of the relationship between the mortal insults of history and the suffering of today was to put that knowledge to work in particular local settings to improve lives and remake society. As a university professor at Harvard, he maintained that the university needed to be out in the real world, responding to its acute threats and chronic problems with strong scholarship and rigorous research that supported the science of implementation. His major books, which are internationally influential, from AIDS and accusation through his last and scholarly masterpiece, Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds, together made the case. Among other things, they challenge the model of scarcity, which holds that for the poorest, prevention can only be the goal, not the best of contemporary medical and social care. In contrast, Paul contended that resources almost always could be mobilized to provide both care and prevention. He also envisaged, and together with his colleagues, famously partnered with Haitian, African, and Latin American community carers and practitioners so that they would become the key players in healthcare systems, development projects, and epidemic responses. He raised hundreds of millions of dollars to support these efforts because private donors and foundation leaders were convinced as much by his moral actions and local knowledge as by his extraordinary, the extraordinary results he and his colleagues achieved through research and direct action. Paul Farmer's true wisdom is that the purposes of the university and of medicine must include the responsibility to cultivate mentorship and collaborative studies with individuals and institutions in resource-poor settings. This animated so many students, academics, and practitioners. It also inspired supporters, donors, and policymakers to reimagine global health action, including in our own country, as a way to reduce health disparities and achieve societal transformation. Yet his vision of social justice is more radical still, calling as it does for reparation and redistribution. Those of us here today share the aspiration, I'm sure, to truly honor Paul's achievements. Harvard was his intellectual and professional home, the natural place to create in his name an enduring legacy in teaching and in research and in clinical work. But just as surely, Paul came to represent Harvard around the world. If Paul were here, I'm presumptuous enough to think he would affirm that Harvard and really all of us who are part of it or of other privileged institutions need to ensure that the highest intellectual standards and commitment to diversity are matched by our efforts at moral education for the social good. Paul Farmer embodied goodness. His own life was the very model of mercy and healing. He called each of us to care for others. He drew out of us a passion to serve a higher purpose. Today is a ritual of social mourning. Like all such rituals, it is a time to mourn our loss and to revive our commitments. It is a time to set free those qualities Paul so magnificently 
exemplified, to carry forward his mission to heal and remake our world. As he accompanied so many, now we, in his footsteps, accompany others. President Bacow, the Harvard family, warmest greetings on my behalf and on behalf of Paul's family. The past seven months have been long and challenging, filled with personal and collective grieving since the monumental loss of our beloved Paul, who passed away early this year on February 22nd, on February 21st, 2022nd, in Butao, Rwanda. This reality is still harsh and painful for our family, friends, and many others to accept. Our son, Charles Sebastian, celebrated his birthday on February 22nd, a day after Paul's passing. He will have to carry this painful memory for the rest of his life. Dad has gone too soon. Haiti, my home country, nourished Paul's belief and vision for an equitable world at the tender age of 24. The infinite sadness and distress over his loss has been exacerbated in yet another season of political turmoil. As the news of his shocking death circulated around Haiti and in celebration of his life there that have followed, Haitians quoted this proverb when a pillar of our community passes on, Yomapu Tombe, which means that a sacred and giant tree has fallen in Haitian Creole. This speaks to the tremendous impact he had as a lifelong fervent advocate. Paul's journey throughout his life was one filled to the brim with compassionate love, service, giving, abundant patience, and intense, intense, and intense an intense energy in, in, in taking on the causes of social justice and equity in health in the most challenging and vulnerable part of the world. Countless individuals, institutions, governments, and funders have come alongside him in this remarkable journey from Harvard to PIH, UGHE, 
Zamila Sante, and beyond. Paul was an inspiring and iconic symbol of our global public health community. He valued the deep friendships and companionships that made the foundation of the community. The quintessence of his philosophy, mission, and teachings will carry on through the generation of students and mentees that he built up over time and deeply cared for. It is this generation that will continue to transform and upend the unequal landscape of this world. In addition to being a beloved member of the Global Health family, Paul was also a loving son, brother, husband, and dad. Embracing Global Health work with the endless energy he did, while also caring for family, might seem to have come as a sacrifice. Yet, for Paul, that was all about making compassionate choices. For those who were close enough to see the struggle, Paul has lived his whole life navigating this difficult tension. He loved his family deeply and did not want to be apart from them, but he also left, he also felt the deep yearning to give his all to bend the arc of the world a bit more towards justice. And this often means large times of physical separation. Yet, Paul always made us feel that fierce love, no matter the distance between us. For example, as many of you know, Paul carried a deep love for his mother, Jeannie, and such a precious bond with his siblings, Katie, Jeff, Peggy, Jennifer, and Jim, that was so beautiful to witness. They loved one another intensely. They even have had their own language and endless nicknames. For years, during his intense travel all around, Jeannie made all the wake-up calls, no matter the different time zones he was in. During our time in France, when he chaired at the prestigious Collège de France in the year 2000, he could neither trust me nor my alarm clock to him to wake him on time for his travel um, commitment. He entrusted only Jeannie. When we turned from his inspiring journeys, during our family time, he often generously shared on events that have deeply touched him. We miss our movie nights. We we'll missed Christmas singing in Lafayette this year and every year and long hours of tree planting and fish pond cleaning during Christmas. Mapua Tombe, the giant tree has fallen indeed, too soon. Paul had the burning passion for planting trees, both lit literally and figuratively, throughout the world. While we all mourn our great tree that has fallen, we take comfort in many more that are growing and standing tall around it everywhere. Here at Harvard, at UGH in Rwanda and Haiti, in Peru, Mexico, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Malawi, Lesotho, and beyond. As we gather here in this storied room at Harvard, the institution that has shaped 
nurtured and, channel and channeled Paul's vision to its pinnacle. Teaching, partnership, companionship have been front and center to make the impact that Paul had. We all now have the moral responsibility to continue this mission and even with greater intensity than before. Ensemble, nap avancé. Together, we will, meet, we will move onward in carrying out Paul's vision for global health, equity, and justice for all through teaching, partnership, and true solidarity in our complement. To close, I leave you with this epigraph from Paul's last book, Fever, Feuds, and Diamonds. It's a quote from William Stafford in The Way It Is, written in 1993, that speaks to Paul's vision. It's read. There is a thread you follow. It goes among things that change, but it doesn't change. People wonder what you are pursuing. You have to explain about the thread, but it is hard for others to see. While you hold it, you can't get lost. Tragedies happen, people get hurt or die, and you suffer and get old. Nothing you can do can stop times unfolding. You don't ever let go of the thread. I encourage everyone here today to never let go of this thread, the thread of global health equity and social justice for all. Thank you to all of you who have contributed to making Paul's short life valuable to the world. Thank you.
I met uh, Paul Farmer 27 years ago in Chicago. I'd been honored with a MacArthur Fellowship. And on the trip to Chicago, I saw all of the people who were going to be gathering there. In those days, they would bring all of the MacArthur Fellows together. And I was completely nervous about the fact that there were so many extraordinary people I'd finally have a chance to meet. Great authors, amazing civil rights legends whose lives I'd read and studied, artists and performers who I admired my whole life. There were people on the list I didn't know, but I was really, really honored. When I got to Chicago, Paul sought me out, and he came up to me and he told me that I work with people who are poor, people who are disfavored, people who are marginalized, and I try to save their lives just like you do. And he said, I'm so excited to talk to you because we have a common vision. And Paul and I immediately started talking, and I was completely blown away by this powerful intellect, this extraordinary ability to articulate and frame concerns and problems with such precision and clarity. I was completely smitten by the way he had this kind of gift for bringing things together. He was also deeply passionate, and I loved that he was so compassionate. Even though I'd planned to spend all of this time with all of these other people, Paul and I spent the entire weekend together. We were just lost in conversation. We were discovering things about one another. Uh, I, I discovered that we were almost exactly the same age. He was three weeks older than me. And later on in life, when we would rarely, every now and then we'd have some disagreement, he would always say, well, well you'll agree with me a little later when you're older, in about three weeks probably. <laughs> and Paul and I just fell in love. We fell in love with this vision, this aspiration, this hope for a more just world. And I remember that weekend like it was magical. At one point, he wanted to give me some literature, and so he took me to his room. And when we got to his room, it was the messiest room I'd ever seen in my life. And I said, how long have you been here? He said, I've just been here two days. I said, how can you make a room this messy in two days? But I love that about him, and we found ourselves plotting all weekend long about what we were going to do about injustice. And Paul was beautiful in the sense that we'd have these conversations and they would go from the absurd to the sublime in just a matter of minutes. And in the midst of one of our conversations this weekend, that weekend, he leaned forward and he said to me, you know what we should do? I said, what's that? He said, we should sneak out and we should go watch the Buffy the Vampire Slayer movie that's playing. <laughs> and that's when I knew I loved Paul. I did. I knew that he was a brother. I knew that he was someone I'd be wrapped up with for the rest of my life. I'm very grateful for the MacArthur, but more than the money, more than the prestige, what I'm grateful to the MacArthur Fellowship for is introducing me to Paul Farmer. We began a journey together. I got back to Alabama. I told everybody about this amazing person I'd met. We looked for ways to connect. I came to Boston, and that's when I met Ophelia Dahl and Jim Kim and Tom White, and Todd McCormick, and brilliant physicians like Loon from Haiti. Then I met Paul's family, his mother, who embraced me and made me feel like I could be her child too. I met his siblings who took me in. Uh, Paul told me about Dee Dee. He was so excited when he got married, and I watched his life expand and grow, and the core of Paul Farmer didn't seem to ever change. That core of beauty and rigor and insight and love. It just expanded, and the work of PIH expanded, and I was so proud of him. He asked me to be on his board, I asked him to be on my board, and we would continue these conversations. He would call me from time to time, and I would call him. We'd have long conversations. And what I loved about Paul is that he seemed to have this infinite capacity to hold people's concerns, hold their needs, and respond to them in the most beautiful way. The last time I saw Paul, we were, we were getting together and we decided we would uh, have a meal and, and just talk through things. He'd been to Alabama at the opening of our new sites and I was in Boston. And as always, when I met Paul, he had a suitcase with him. He was taking some late night flight to Haiti or Rwanda or someplace. And we sat down and we started talking and I was telling him how much I had struggled during the Zoom era and that I would sometimes just get tired. There was something about that that just exhausted me. And I was giving a talk to some group in California, and I was up late one night, and I confided in him 
that during this talk, I actually felt myself falling asleep. And while I was talking, I realized at some moment, I, I, I was hearing myself and I was talking about something nonsensical and absurd like audio reform. And I later learned that, uh, Paul laughed at that, he thought that was hysterical, and I later learned that he shared that story with his children and his siblings and would text me pictures of them laughing about me, uh, talking nonsensically about audio reform. But we would have deep conversations, and that was the conversation. That time was when Paul asked me something. He said, do you believe in angels? And we would ask each other these kinds of questions. And I told him that I was so proud of the fact that this case I had argued before the U.S. Supreme Court that banned life without parole sentences for children was resulting in relief for lots of kids who had been condemned to die in prison, children put in forever cells who had been told they were beyond hope and redemption, that they would have to die in prison, were actually being freed, they were actually getting to places, and I was so proud of that and so grateful, and I told him about that, but then I told him that the case I'd actually argued before the court was involved a 14-year-old boy who I was uh, really, really committed to, and this young man was so loyal to me. He believed in my ability to help him so much, but when we went back for his resentencing, the judge condemned him to die in prison again. And I told him on the day of that sentencing, I was just overwhelmed and heartbroken. And I remember being on the phone with my client and I was just emotional. I was apologizing that we hadn't gotten a better result. And then I remembered that this young man <laughs> decided to comfort me. He said, please, Brian, don't cry. Don't worry about it. I know you're going to get me home. And I was embarrassed that my condemned client, this child was comforting me. It made me feel like I had failed. And I was telling Paul all of this. And I've just felt that bad the rest of the day. And I was going home that evening and I told Paul that I'd gone into some shop to get some soup or a salad to take home. And when I went into the shop, there were four or five older black women sitting at a table, and they recognized me as I came into the shop, and they smiled, and I smiled back. I didn't pay them any attention. And then I went over to the counter, and I got my, my soup and my salad, and I was leaving. And just as I was about to walk out of the door, one of those older women, she shouted across the restaurant. She said, hey, come over here. And I looked around and she pointed at me. She said, hey, come over here. And I was embarrassed because she was really shouting. And I walked over to her. And when I got over there, she said, lean down. And I didn't quite understand what she was saying. She said, lean down. And I leaned down. And when I leaned down, she rose up a little bit. And she put her hand behind my head. And then she leaned up. And she kissed me on the forehead. And then she looked me in the eye and she said, you keep on keeping on. And I didn't know what to say. And so she said, go home, go home, just go home. And I got in my car and I told Paul that when I got in my car, I cried, I laughed, but then I felt better. And I told Paul that story because I said, I believe she was an angel. I don't know anything about her life. I don't know anything about what she does, but I believe this was a person who understands the power of grace, the power of beauty. This was a person who is actually open-hearted enough to lift other people up. And I said, that's why I believe in angels. I believe there are people who understand the power of grace, that understand the power of beauty, people who can lift one another up. Paul and I kept talking. We probably talked about all kinds of absurd things, and it was time to go. And we hugged each other as we usually do before we parted, but this time, Paul just seemed to hug a little tighter. He lingered a little while. And just before I pulled away, he reached up and he kissed me on the forehead. And he said, you keep on keeping on. And at first I thought he was joking and I pulled back, but I noticed that he had a tear on his face. I said, thank you. I said, you keep on keeping on. And Paul Farmer is the only person in my life who had this amazing ability to hold a tear and a smile at the same time. And he smiled and he said, no, you keep on keeping on. <laughs> and of course I said, no, you keep on keeping on. And we left each other childless, childishly shouting at each other, keep on keeping on. And he was intent, we were both intent on being the last one to say it, but because he was three weeks older, I gave in. And he said, you keep on keeping on. I believe Paul Farmer was an angel. I do. 
Not in the sense that he was perfect, not in the sense that he was flawless, not in that sense, but Paul Farmer was someone who understood the power of grace, the power of beauty, and the power of love. Paul Farmer was all in. He had this amazing, infinite capacity to lift people up, and that's what angels do. I am persuaded that Paul was a visionary. And I don't think the dream of visionaries can be buried in graves. I don't think the spirit of a visionary can be held by a tomb. I do not believe his life force is buried in some ground. I think it's all around us. And those of us who believe like he believes that we have to confront oppression, that we have to overcome injustice, that we have to bring down the barriers that create unjust applications of health care, that we have to heal the world, those of us who share that vision need to tap into that vision, that life force that is Paul Farmer. It is all around us. And I am persuaded that when we hold on to it, we hold on to the most important thing about Paul Farmer, which was his infinite capacity, his dream of healing the world. I sometimes think about what it means to live a life like his. And what I want to say to his family, his precious, beloved family, that I want you to know that I know that Paul cared so deeply. Paul died suddenly. He died unexpectedly. He didn't have time to say the things and do the things that I know he wanted to say. I talk a lot about my grandmother, and I've been thinking about this because my heart was broken when Paul died. I just really struggled. And I remembered my grandmother. I grew up in a community where black children couldn't go to the public schools. I actually started my education in a colored school. <clears throat> when I was a little boy, they didn't let black kids attend the schools. And when integration came, my grandmother, this wise, extraordinary human being who was the daughter of people who were enslaved, was really worried about us. And she started doing this thing she'd never done before. She would come up to me and she'd give me these hugs. And my grandmother would squeeze me so tightly, I thought she was trying to hurt me. And I'd wiggle to get away with her, but she would get away from her, but she would just hold me even more tightly. And then my grandmother would see me an hour later and she'd say, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And if I said no, my grandmother would jump on me again. <laughs> and so by the time I was 10, my grandmother had taught me every time I would see her, the first thing I would say is, Mama, I always feel you hugging me. And she'd smile this smile and I didn't appreciate what she was teaching me. My grandmother worked as a domestic her whole life. She lived into her 90s, but when she got into her 90s, she fell one day and she broke her hip. And then she was diagnosed with cancer, and my grandmother was dying. I was in college at the time, and I went to see her, and I just couldn't make peace of being in the world without this precious human being, my grandmother. And I went into her room, and I just sat down next to her. She was on the bed. Her eyes were closed. I grasped her hand. She wasn't responding. She wasn't saying anything. But I persuaded myself that if I kept talking, my grandmother wouldn't die. And so I started talking, and I talked, and I talked, and I talked, and I talked. And after a long time, one of my relatives came in and said, Brian, you can't do this. You can't just keep talking. You're going to have to go. And I remember standing up with a heavy heart, and I took a step, and that's when my grandmother opened her eyes. And then I remembered my grandmother squeezing my hand, and my grandmother turned to me, and the last thing she said to me, she said, Brian, do you still feel me hugging you? And then she said, I want you to know I'm always going to be hugging you. I want to say to the farmer family that if I know my friend, if I know my brother, I know that he'd be saying to each and every one of you, he will always be hugging you. There will never be a time when the embrace of this man's life will not be meaningful, will not be forceful, will not be felt. And what I want to say to each and every one of you, all of you who share this vision for ending inequality, for fighting oppression, for pushing for justice, all of the physicians and the healers and the healthcare workers, all of the advocates, I hope you will embrace the life and the spirit of Paul Farmer. And what I want to say to each and every one of you on behalf of my friend, on behalf of my brother, keep on keeping on until we create a world that is healed, until we create a world where justice prevails, until we bring more hope, more mercy, more compassion, more justice in the places where it's desperately needed. Keep on keeping on. Thank you all.
The fox knows many things, but the hedgehog knows one big thing. So wrote the Greek poet Archilochus in the 7th century BCE. Many centuries later, the philosopher Isaiah Berlin wrote a famous essay on Tolstoy, in which he rehashed the idea that people could be classified as foxes or hedgehogs. Berlin acknowledged the shallowness of such distinctions, but he also claimed that all classifications throw a light on something. Today, I want to share with you the light that this distinction has cast for me on my friend and mentor, Paul Farmer. The fox knows many things. Paul certainly knew many things. The breadth of his learning and scholarship was astonishing, even intimidating to those of us in his department. You might think it was enough to be an accomplished infectious disease clinician and a groundbreaking anthropologist, but Paul's expertise went far beyond that. He taught economics and philosophy with Amartya Sen. He wrote liberation theology with Gustavo Gutierrez. His book, his last book, was a sweeping history of Sierra Leone. His plans, his blueprints for hospitals and plans for hospital gardens revealed yet another dimension of this extraordinary intellect. And not only did Paul know many things, but he wanted us, his friends and faculty, to also know many things and to integrate those things into our scholarship and our practice. After Paul died, I read a memorial written by his longtime friend and fellow anthropologist, Adia Benton. She referred to his commitment to being an undisciplined thinker, to actively undermining the disciplinary silos of academia. My colleague, Matt Bonds, who's here today, told me he thought that the source of Paul's creativity was his refusal to stay within the boundaries of academic disciplines and his unique ability to connect and integrate. In other words, to undiscipline the field of global health. If knowing many things makes one a fox, Paul was as foxy as they come. He also knew many people, and one of the most remarkable things about him is that he knew them all deeply. Speaking at, memorials, at, at Paul's memorial service at Trinity Church last spring, Ophelia Dahl said that if Paul had been there, he would have wanted to acknowledge all of those present and the many hundreds who were listening in from afar. And he would have done so with a personal aside for each of his mourners, some humorous tidbit drawn from his prodigious memory of previous shared conversations, a demonstration of his deep interest and connection with so many friends. But Paul was fox-like in more ways than in the breadth and depth of his knowledge. The fox plays a prominent role in the mythology and folklore of many different cultures. For some tribes of the American Southwest and Mexico, the fox is an irreverent trickster. While among some Northern Californian groups, silver fox and coyote are the creator gods of the earth, wise and compassionate guides. In the Napache myth, fox is a Prometheus-like figure who stole fire from the gods to bring its comfort to mortal beings. One of Paul's most endearing qualities was his puckish mischievousness. He would often preside over faculty meetings with all due decorum, only to be texting irreverent and often hilarious commentary to those of us sitting around the table, so it was almost impossible to keep from laughing out loud. But like the fox of the Achuami, he also served as a guide to many of us providing the insight and context that helped us overcome the frustrations we encountered in our daily work. And while I'm not sure if the fire that animated him had been stolen from the gods, I do know that he shared this fire with all of those he worked with, and that he tended to the flames in each of us whenever they seemed to falter. But despite all this foxishness, I feel that Paul was a hedgehog. Archilochus apparently never made quite clear what exactly the one big thing is that the hedgehog knows. Some readers suggest that it was a simple but effective defense strategy of rolling into a ball covered with needle-like spikes. And it's true that Paul could be prickly at times. I recall some years ago when I was the target of that prickliness. I once got a funny text in the middle of a department seminar, and I wrongly assumed that the text had come from a friend in the audience. I am embarrassed to say that I wrote back, commenting on Paul's recent haircut. 
OMG, what on earth happened to Paul's hair? <laughs> it was only when I didn't get a response that it dawned on me that I had sent this message to Paul himself. <laughs> Neither of us ever mentioned hair again. <laughs> but Paul didn't forget. For many years afterwards, he would tease me about my lack of cell phone and texting skills. He could be, more, could be prickly about more important matters as well. Most of us have seen an angry young Paul in the documentary Bending the Ark when he shared in an international meeting his suspicion that bankers in general were not getting a lot of sex because he said they spent so much time screwing the poor. But it was not this prickliness that made Paul a hedgehog, but rather his single-minded vision and message. For those of us who worked with him, that message was so loud and clear that it seems almost superfluous to put it into words. But I think there is a word for it, and one that Paul would have endorsed. The one great thing that Paul knew was the power of accompaniment. In its narrowest sense, and one which is not narrow at all, accompaniment is the model that Paul proposed and implemented across the globe to provide health care and the social and economic supports that health care requires. Above all, it involves being there, as one of Paul's own mentors, Brian Good, recently put it. And staying there with the poor and the ill until the end, wherever and whenever that may be. It involves the integration of the many relevant disciplines which the foxy Paul excelled, but it brings these fields together to serve the singular purpose of improving the lives of the sick and the destitute. Here are Paul's words from a commencement speech he gave at the Kennedy School in 2011. To accompany someone is to go somewhere with him or her, to break bread together, to be present on a journey with a beginning and an end. There's an element of mystery, of openness in accompaniment. I'll go with you and support you on your journey wherever it leads. I'll keep you company and share your fate for a while. Paul may have originally conceived of accompaniment as an approach to providing health care and social support to the vulnerable. But for him, the idea of accompaniment, drawn from liberation theology, expanded to encompass all the important activities of his life, whether that was breaking bread with friends, mentoring medical students, conceiving of and building the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda, or serving on Harvard's Committee on the Legacy of Slavery that led to its commitment to financial partnership with HCBUs. For Paul, the concept of accompaniment provided a guide for how to be in the world. And for those of us who are lucky enough to be part of this revered university, accompaniment provides a way to work with and for those whose lack of privilege has often been the price of our own good fortune. And lest you think that envisioning Paul as a hedgehog is demeaning, that a hedgehog is a diminutive denizen of domestic English hedgerow, I want to point out that like the fox, the hedgehog is well represented in the pantheon of mythical animals. In some religions of northeast China, the hedgehog figure Ba Xian was venerated as a god of medicine and caregiving. In other words, a practitioner of expert mercy. Expert mercy was a term that Paul loved and often used to describe the mission of clinical medicine. And like Ba Xian, Paul practiced expert mercy. Fox-like, in his undisciplined, mischievous breadth of knowledge, he was ultimately committed to the big idea of accompaniment writ large. And he asked us all to join him in that mission. Thank you. I want to start by extending my condolences to all of Paul's family, friends, colleagues, and students. Paul Farmer is that rare person who connects to a moral truth and devotes their entire life to helping those who need it and inspiring other people to come do the same. I never met anyone like Paul. 
He was a moral leader. He was a mentor. He told us that injustices shouldn't be allowed. In Haiti, in Rwanda, his organization goes out into very tough places and they bring in doctors from the U.S., but over time they are training the local people and providing levels of health service that most people would say should be out of reach. This is going to be a new hospital. He innovated on how you can help an entire community even beyond their health needs. In Haiti, Paul learned to speak in the local language. And as we'd go to a new group, at the start, often somebody would give kind of a long thing and we'd sit there and wait for him to translate it. They were saying, almost certainly saying, hey, Dr. Paul, you saved our lives. It's incredible. You know, we're so glad you're here. You bring these new medicines, you train people. You know, he wasn't going to pass that along, <laughs> speaking about himself. So he would just say, obligatory praise. He wanted to get to the meat of, okay, what more can we do? And, you know, let's, let's hear that. He instructed, he inspired, and he loved his teaching at Harvard. He knew he could find people there to convert to his cause. He knew the university, you know, believed in his work. Well, there aren't many real heroes where the purity of their commitment and their way they articulate those values inspires you know, millions of people. We'd all aspire to be like that, but very, very few are. And it's a tragedy that he died young. I hope Paul's values and dreams stay strong, even without him here setting such a profound example. We'll never have another Paul Farmer, but we need people who are at least somewhat like him. Brilliant about healthcare in the developing world, passion for saving lives, commitment to the belief that deaths anywhere are just as tragic as deaths here in the United States. So all of you who are carrying on Paul's mission, making the world healthier and more equitable, are uh, doing justice to this amazing person. I mean, you gotta love this job. That's how we all need to honor his incredible legacy. Just don't look at the houses, I'm saying. I really don't think you should look. It's August of last year, and I'm sitting in the heat of a hotel lobby in Port-au-Prince, Haiti. My voice is wavering, and I feel my body trembling, and I'm brushing away tears. I feel myself losing composure, and I'm just trying to hold it together. I'm talking to Paul Farmer on the phone. Around this conversation are exhausted people. There was an earthquake a few days earlier in the south of Haiti. 2,200 people are among the counted dead. Who knows how many are among the uncounted dead because the shaking and the collapsing happened in a very poor and a very rural area. And the poor and the rural are sadly always shafted. 12,000 people are injured, 100,000 people are displaced. Paul's coming to Haiti, I'm going from Haiti, and we've loosely organized to meet, but he's been delayed and is boarding a plane in Miami en route, so here we are now on the phone. I tell Paul, don't look at the houses, because in my last few days in the disaster zone, with my courageous, relentless friends from Zami La Santé, my own eyes have been constantly drawn to the piles of rubble from collapsed buildings. In between seeing patients dropping off supplies and trying to understand the epidemiology of infectious diseases in the disaster, my eyes are repeatedly drawn to the flattened infrastructure, the hordes of cement, the ceiling of the house where the floor should be, 
and the people standing by in despair, staring at the diga, the damage. I am sure that among the cinder block, I will see human remains there. While I should be contemplating the risk factors for a cholera outbreak, I imagine the lost souls there, trapped, gone. But I know this line of thinking is not very healthy, so I try to avert my eyes, focus on the living, on the numbers. Don't look at the houses. This earthquake is dreadfully reminiscent of another such disaster 10 years and eight months earlier in January of 2010. An earthquake that me and many colleagues here survived, that some colleagues didn't, and an event that impacted millions of people, including partners in health and including Paul. Paul wrote a book about it, as he prolifically seemed to do in his seemingly spare time. On the phone now, I have a desire to protect Paul from connecting the current disaster to those painful memories of that one. I have a sense sometimes that he's weighed down by the tragedy of all of this, but we don't talk about that too much, so I'm not really sure. Since his passing, I reread Paul's book, Haiti After the Earthquake, and I note that he both opened and closed the memoir of that first year after the 2010 earthquake by writing about sorrow. Of the memorial service in Boston on the one-year anniversary of the 2010 quake, he wrote, Some spared against long odds can still taste January 12th as the unfamiliar flavor of relief or gratitude. Most still taste the bitter dregs of sorrow. Sorrow and grief are never far away in global health work. At least this is true in the global health work that is at the edges of change, that is proximate to the needs of the patient, that is focused on alleviating the appalling, non-self-inflicted disease of impoverishment. Grief while counting the lives lost, sorrow while designing interventions for the suffering, sadness at the injustice of it all, how hard it is to have others understand the urgency of the work, the primacy of the work, people with no fuel, political inaction despite the research and the facts, debates over the effectiveness of life rafts while people drown. On the phone, Paul's voice wavered, and for a moment he cried, but not just a small tear, a guttural sobbing. I know, Lou, he said, I know. We had a momentary silence, I looked around at the steely reserve of dozens of Haitian health and humanitarian colleagues, including my own, who never seemed to cry. Paul sniffled, composed himself, and then cracked a joke in an Irish accent by cursing in a way that I can't repeat here. And so we continued on the business of the day. I was embarrassed later by my lack of composure, like I'm not strong enough or I'm not tough enough for this work that Paul would think less of me. Don't look is what I told Paul because I had been finding the sorrow of those days intrusive, unproductive. I didn't really think it had its correct place in the balance of my work and my feelings. I wanted to push it away and to send it away. But in fact, I had also experienced real joy in those previous days too. The joy of service, the joy of accompanying others in their time of difficulty, the joy of street food very late at night, the hum of a generator lighting the only light on the street and piping hot fried plantains, the joy of a welcoming place to sleep after navigating a bridge that was down and a long drive home in the dark, the joy of doing the right thing with friends. Khalil Gibran wrote this about sorrow. Your joy is your sorrow unmasked. And the self-same well from which your laughter rises was oftentimes filled with your tears. And how else can it be? The deeper that sorrow carves into your being, the more joy you can contain. When Paul was interviewed after winning the 2021 Aurora Humanitarian Prize, he said, it's not work that's driven by anxiety, despair, or fear. It's work that is compelled by real conviction that it's the right thing to do but it's a joyful thing to do as well, to serve others and to be around others in difficult circumstances. 
While our regular dalliance with grief and sorrow in global health was not enough training to prepare us for losing Paul so early, I know that this deep sorrow that I feel, that we all feel, is a testament to the love and joy that being connected to Paul in some way or other brought all of us. A few days after our phone call, when Paul had returned home, he texted me to say, by the way, I am not for one moment sorry for the tears. I asked Paul not to look, but Paul is the one who reminded us all to look, to look and take action, to look and to do, to look and to bring expert mercy to solve the hurt, to look and to bring our moral and intellectual selves to treat the maladies, to look and to bring our institutions with us and help them look and see and act, and to do all of this from a place of joy and love. I hope we can fill the deep scar of Paul's passing with renewed hope and compassion and expertise, and that we will fill our lives and our life's purpose with the joy of doing this work, intricately as it so often is, interlaced with the sorrows. Napgarde polo, nu paplage. We're looking, Paul. We'll keep looking. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to thank President Bacow and Harvard University for putting together this wonderful memorial for our dear friend, Paul. This place and all of you who've been part of it were so important for Paul. He used to refer to the galaxy of institutions that constituted his home here, the jewels and the crown of our country. Paul was a genius at harnessing the power of Harvard for good. In our first foray uh, into global health policy around multidrug-resistant tuberculosis, we employed what Paul used to call the Harvard Big Shot strategy. Paul and I were still trainees, and others on our team were students, but we were known as the Harvard group in the TV world, and boy, did that make a difference. For Paul, the Harvard institutions and partners in health made up the perfect partnership to tackle the world's most difficult and important health problems. Paul had a huge ambitions for this alliance, and he insisted on bringing everyone into the tent. Students, of course, were essential to the endeavor. And while the foundation of his worldview was to make a preferential option for the poor, he also made a preferential option for students. They flocked to his lectures, and after each one, there would be a long line to talk to him, and he would stay there until he had a meaningful exchange with each and every one. He was dedicated to his colleagues, especially junior faculty, many of whom were once his students. He supported so many of you here today as you grew into being leading researchers and practitioners in global health. I know you all made him very proud. He also had a very particular role, uh, excuse me, very particular view of the role of PIH in, the, in this partnership. PIH was critical, he would say, because it was the effector arm. And he insisted that you can't teach a subject as important as global health without one. We all know that it's, it's it just, excuse me for a second, is there water anywhere here? Ah. We all know that his scholarly work, the institutions he built, the patients he healed, 
and the students he nurtured will keep his spirit alive for many years to come. But having had the great privilege of watching and learning from him for four decades, even more than his achievements, it was his way of being in the world. Indeed, his habits, habits of the heart, habits of the mind, that are his most important and challenging legacy. Paul brought to the world what the Italian philosopher Antonio Gramsci called a pessimism of the intellect and an optimism of the will. Scholars debate, but seem to argue that for Gramsci, this meant that one should have a clear-eyed view of how bad things are without losing hope. Paul had an intimate knowledge of extreme poverty around the world, and he was a champion for the kind of research and service that would give us an ever more clear-eyed view of its dimensions. He was also such a powerful source of hope for us all. 25 years ago, in the middle of our MDR-TB fight, we were at a global TB meeting where the air was rife with what Paul would call immodest claims of causality. Otherwise, brilliant TB experts were coming up with wild theories to explain away the threat of drug-resistant TB. One very nice doctor from a nice organization that I won't name, but reportedly has no borders, <laughs> <clears throat> told me that the prisoners in Russia had found a way to hide and not take their pills, even while being directly observed by a nurse in the prison pharmacy. The nurses would give them the pills and watch, but instead of putting them in their mouths and swallowing, they would throw the pills onto their shoulders and hide them in their shoulder cavity. They would then sell those pills to others for money or cigarettes. That, he explained, was the reason they were not getting better not the fact that they had drug-resistant TB. When I told Paul that story, his first response was, did you ask him to demonstrate that technique for you? <laughs> After we had a good laugh, he said to me, aren't you glad we have O for the P, option for the poor? He went on, you see, Jimmy, people of faith believe in something called revealed truth. That means a lot of different things to different people, but to me, it simply means that we're required to treat the sick poor wherever we find them, with whatever tools we can gather. That wonderful, liberating clarity is a gift. Paul's optimism of the will is a gift he shared with us all. It gave him joy and a lightness that was more infectious than any bug he ever treated. For Paul, optimism about whether serious illnesses can be treated in poor countries was not based on existing data or the consensus of experts. Optimism was always a moral choice. And as for the gentleman with few borders who told us the tall tale of prisoner non-adherence, of course, Paul befriended him and kept in touch till the end. So today, in this elaborate setting on the campus where Paul and I received what he called our ridiculously elaborate educations, we come together to pay tribute and to understand our responsibility as stewards of the ridiculously elaborate gifts that he left for us. At the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine and the Brigham Division of Global Health Equity, we now have a program for just about everything and social change. There's so much here, but after months of struggling with the implications of Paul's passing, I realized that beyond the institutions he built, it was his way of being in the world that was both his greatest gift and most daunting challenge. While each of our paths will differ from Paul's, I humbly offer a few ideas about how we might be in the world if we're serious about preserving and extending Paul's legacy. First, we must nurture our own pessimism of the intellect and strive for an even clearer sense of both how bad things are and what we can do to make them better. Well-designed epidemiological studies, clinical research, and building new fields like global health delivery were so important for Paul, and he would never forgive us if we stepped away from pushing forward on each of these areas. He'd also remind us of the urgency of the task 
All these efforts exist in a moral context where poverty and inequality are rising, and billions of people will die of what he called stupid deaths. Second, we must nurture our own optimism of the will and get to a place of hope. Paul taught us to be clear about the moral imperative to care for the sick poor and look at data and evidence as conversation starters, not conversation stoppers. There's always a way forward in serving the poor. We just have to work harder to find it. Paul was also wildly optimistic about people. From a young age, he told me that it was difficult for him to hold a grudge when he had a spat with one of his siblings. So he'd write himself a note saying, remember, you're mad at Ktel, or Jimpy, or Jedry, or Jendo, or Pedzi, these nicknames. But he told me that despite his best efforts, he would forget and only discover his notes to self after he had completely dissolved his animus. When it came to people whose polit political views he despised, he wished desperately to never have to sit next to them on an airplane, or even worse, see them as a patient, because he knew he would end up liking them. <laughs> so, to ensure Paul's legacy, I'm suggesting that we have no choice but to try to walk at least a little bit in his footsteps. Not to judge ourselves as we know he never would, but to stand on his shoulders for brief moments so that we might pierce the fog of a world that forgets and sometimes actively hides the suffering of the poor. Frankly, this is difficult for me because early in my career, mentors like Howard Hyatt and Arthur Kleinman told me, Jim, you don't have to be like Paul. We will never see anyone like him again. Do what you're best at and just be happy that Paul is your partner. Since Paul's passing, I've realized that so many of my life choices were fundamentally shaped by the knowledge that Paul Edward Farmer was somewhere in the world doing, doing work that was brilliant, compassionate, and redemptive for all of us, including me. Losing him broke my world. In the midst of a grief that's deeper than anything I've known, every day I'm more inspired by what Paul did and even more who he was. We now have no choice but to try to be a bit more like him. And maybe if we all try, even just a little, we can together fill a small part of the gaping hole in our world that emerged with his passing. There is no university in the world that can bring Paul's vision to fruition like Harvard. With Partners in Health as the effector arm of this powerful alliance, we have no excuse but to transform the future for the poor who Paul loved so dearly. Pell, we're all here for you, and I want you to know, Harvard did you right. Rest in peace, buddy. We love you. Good morning. I'm George Daly. I'm the Dean of Harvard Medical School. Paul was one of my chairs. He used to call me boss, lovingly. Never did I doubt who was boss in that relationship. Uh, but I want to thank everyone who has spoken here this morning. Your words pay elegant tribute a man who represented the best of humanity and the best of medicine. And Paul raised the bar for all of us. Now, Paul has been called one of the greatest medical humanitarians of our time, but I think he was more than that. I think he was one of the greatest medical humanitarians of all time. Paul reminded us of the highest calling of medicine to serve those in need. Now, I've noted several times since we lost Paul 
that he was the heart and soul of Harvard Medical School. But what happens when that heart stops beating? And I've been grappling with that question for many months. Now, I know there will never, ever be another Paul, and that we as a community must find ways to carry on Paul's good work. Paul's optimism, his dogged insistence on solutions would demand that of us. And what I do know for sure is that Paul's heart beats in every one of us. And by channeling Paul's aspirations into concrete action, we evince a collective heartbeat that pumps lifeblood into our scholarship and our service and makes Harvard more capable of affecting change than ever before. Paul was adamant that great universities, especially Harvard, must drive the movement of resources down the steep gradient of inequality, that they must promote global health equity, not as an ancillary pursuit, but as a core value and practice. To Paul, global health was not just a discipline, it was an all-encompassing mode of being, a worldview that academia must adopt and proselytize comprehensively and unapologetically. Indeed, he felt this way because he knew the critical role that scholarship played in his life. In 1989, as he sat on a hill overlooking the village of Kanj in Haiti, he worked on his PhD thesis in anthropology, combining ethnography, history, economics, epidemiology, to unpack the way blame and accusation distorted the story of the HIV crisis. Now, his mind was constantly assimilating ideas from different fields, psychiatry, law, politics, sociology, ministry. And in doing so, he created an entirely new field of thought for future generations to absorb and carry forward. So to live up to Paul's vision, we have a major task in front of us, a responsibility to see patients, all patients, as individuals with complex sources of pain and suffering, both physiological and societal. Paul's memory inspires us to look to the future, to empower our students to internalize a holistic image of health and healing, and to uncover the barriers to well-being that exists for the neediest. Paul's memory inspires us to develop scalable models of care delivery. Paul's memory inspires us to reject the one-dimensional notion of charity and embrace the more unifying concept of equity. Paul's memory inspires us to celebrate and enrich our residencies and our training programs in global health. And Paul would want us, as a university community, not just the medical community, to embrace health equity as a sacred goal of our enterprise here in Boston and everywhere around the globe. So to usher in this era and to rededicate ourselves to his teachings, which will live on at Harvard Medical School and in this great university, we will hear Paul's words spoken by his friends and his family. And as these words reverberate, Paul's words reverberate, I encourage you to reflect on their meaning and how they might apply to your work, to your studies, to your everyday life. Let us all take inspiration from Paul's words and feel his heart beating in all of us so that we can all commit ourselves to achieving the ideals of a healthier, more just world. Thank you.
how can a research university address problems of healthcare deliveries, especially for the people, for the poor people or the ones vulnerable? The possibilities are, as we say in clinical lab when counting blood cells, EN, DC, too numerous to count. But for those who wish to build robust academic programs in global health, there are three chief categories of action, research, training, and service. The essence of global health equity is the idea that something so precious as health might be viewed as a right. Accompaniment. Accompaniment, it is an elastic term. It means just what you'd imagine and more. There's an element of mystery, of openness, in accompaniment. I'll go with you and support you on your journey, and wherever it leads, I'll be with you. I'll, I'll keep you company and share your faith for a while. And by a while, I don't mean just a little while. But, but if you're asking my opinion, I would argue that a social justice approach should be central to medicine and utilized to be central to public health. This could be very simple. The well should take care of the sick. With rare exceptions, all of your most important achievements on this planet will come from working with others, or in a word, partnership. This is not for health professionals only. It's for humans to worry about global health equity. If you want to manage chronic disease like AIDS, TB, malaria, diabetes, major mental illness, cancer, you need community health workers. We want that message lodged in our teaching and in our writing. Most of all, you need persistence. As long as poverty and inequality persist, as long as people are wounded and imprisoned and despised, we humans will need accompaniment practical, spiritual, intellectual. For me, an area of moral clarity is, you're in front of someone who's suffering and you have the tools at your disposal to alleviate that suffering or even eradicate it and you act. True accompaniment does not privilege technical expertise above solidarity or compassion or a willingness to tackle what may seem to be an insuperable challenge. It requires cooperation, openness, and teamwork. The notion of cultural humility entails acknowledging not that it takes decades to understand another culture, but rather that anyone can learn about another person, another family, another patient, another village or island, another town or district or nation. Anyone can learn about the suffering of others, including that caused by serious illness or injury. Anyone can apply not only knowledge, 
but also compassion and pragmatic solidarity to lessen the suffering about which we so often write. It's easy for me to credit Haiti. It's easy and correct. But it's really Harvard and Haiti and the tension between them. It was that tension between my own good fortune and others' misfortune that got me onto interrogating socialization for scarcity on behalf of others. I say, you really ought to do what you like to do, not, because what, not what you think you should. Because if you're going to make a difference in this kind of work, it takes decades. Not everyone wants to be a nurse or a physician. Again, you need staff, stuff, space, and systems. And that requires contributions from many fields, from architecture to management. You're part of a big and diverse team. That I will have to climb And there will be battles That I will have to fight Victory or defeat It's up to me to decide But how can I expect to win If I never try, oh I just can't give up now I've come too far from where I started from Nobody told me the road would be easy And I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me Never said there wouldn't be trials Never said I wouldn't fall 
never said that everything would go the way I wanted to go. But when my back is against the wall and I feel all hope is gone, I just lift my head up to the sky and say, help me to be strong. Oh, I just can't give up now I've come too far from where I started from Nobody told me the road would be easy And I don't believe he brought me this far to leave me Though you didn't bring me out here to leave me lonely And even when I can't see clearly I know that you are with me so I can't Ooh, I can't give up now I've come so far I would like to thank everyone here today for making this such a beautiful memorial. Friends, I close with another parable from Jesus, from the Gospel of Matthew. In this parable, Christ told believers that you are the light of the world, a city that is set on the hill cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand that it gives light to all who are in the house. 
Let your light so shine before people that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We have heard of Paul's good works. He was a light that shone brightly around the world. Paul believed in walking in the company of the sick, the poor, the needy, and the vulnerable. In each of you is a light. Let us leave here resolved that our light will drive away the dark shadows of despair wherever our feet may take us. May we leave this gathering with the peace of God. Amen.
Hello. We're going to begin. <laughs> if everyone can start to take their seats, please. Everyone can please take their seats. <laughs> Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, and I hope you enjoyed your lunch. Welcome back to Sanders Theater for the inaugural symposium to honor the moral and intellectual legacy of Paul Farmer. At this time, we again remind you to please turn off your cell phones and pagers, and please refrain from any photography. We're also delighted to share that this symposium is now live streamed and recorded for all those unable to be here with us today. As you've seen in your program, you have an insert with all helpful information. And we hope you enjoy the symposium. And thank you for spending time with us to honor Paul today. Members of the Farmer family, dear friends, dear colleagues, my name is Salman Kishavji, and I'm professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. On behalf of Harvard University, I'd like to welcome all of you to this afternoon's symposium to honor the moral and intellectual legacy of our dear friend, Paul Farmer. Paul spent almost 40 years at this university as a student of medicine and anthropology, as a teacher, a physician, a professor, chair of the Department of, of Global Health and Social Medicine, chair of the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and ultimately the Kola Cotronas University professor. And we must remember he did this while being a driving force at Partners in Health, the solidarity organization that he co-founded, and while working shoulder to shoulder in communities to deliver equitable health care. And he loved Harvard because he saw it as a place from which he, and all of us could repair the world. To repair the world through deep learning, through understanding and revealing the social forces that cause misery and suffering as a path towards justice. What is known in Hebrew as tikkun olam. I first met Paul in 1994 and in the ensuing years I had the opportunity to spend time with him in Haiti and Peru and Russia and many other places and I had the privilege to learn from him, see patience with him, teach with him, and the blessing of engaging in many, many debates and conversations with him. And as I process my own shock at his death, my own grief, and as we all process our shock and grief, we know that given Paul's singular focus on the struggle for health equity, 
if we, were, if we were to delay in this mission of repairing the world, he would tell us to get back to it. And he saw the university, particularly this university, as a big part of the mission. After all, it was here at Harvard that Paul spent so much time teaching and learning. To repair the world is not easy, and in thinking about the ways that Paul approached this, one cannot help but remember his love for gardening. Paul was, to put it mildly, a gardening aficionado. He knew the name of every plant, and he took gardens very seriously. In fact, in every facility he helped build, he insisted that there be trees and gardens. But it wasn't just gardening for the sake of it. It was more than that. It was gardening as caregiving, as a way of ensuring that people who were sick were treated with the dignity they deserved. Gardening as a tool for social transformation. Gardening as a form of cultivation, both literally and, the mind, and of the mind. It was gardening as a way to start repairing the world. About 25 years ago, when I was with Paul and Kanj in Haiti, I commented on the beautifully shaded area near the entrance to the clinic under which patients were sitting and being fed. It was a beautiful space, you know, a respite from the burning sun, a balm for the weary and the sick. And Paul smiled and told me that it had been his hope that when people came to Kanj for care, they would have a place where they could get some respite, and that this waiting area had been purpose-built for that, that it had been part of the plans. A bomb for the weary and the sick, and part of the plans from the very beginning. That's the kind of gardener Paul was. And I recount the story today because I know that his academic writing, his profound intellectual contribution across multiple fields, and his teaching, his life here at the university, was one of his gardens. And with all the great things Paul accomplished, it's tempting to focus on the trees and flowers that he planted, of which there were many. But I think that Emma Klippinger, co-founder of the nonprofit Gardens for Health, got it right when she wrote soon after Paul's death that he didn't plant seeds so much as magically change the soil such that an entirely, entirely new ecosystems could grow and thrive. And she's right. Paul was building gardens of great complexity, and he was not just focusing on the large trees and plants. He was focusing on the soil, the richness of the soil through which transformational ideas would grow. And of all the elaborate gifts that Paul has left us, to borrow Jim Kim's words from this morning, of all the elaborate gifts, his intellectual legacy, which has already shaped the thinking of a generation of people across many fields and many geographies, is the soil of a verdant garden. It's a soil that has instilled in so many a drive for equity and a determination to build an entirely different moral ecosystem. So as we look to the future, it's essential for us to learn more about and learn from this profound intellectual legacy. This is what we are starting to do today. Paul has said on many occasions, poverty is not some accident of nature, but the result of historically given and economically driven forces. It's the result of social structures, social arrangements that are created by humans. And because of that, he called for rigorous scholarship to understand these forces and structures as a path to changing them. This type of analysis had to be historically deep, deep enough to address recent and distant historical antecedents to present day poverty and suffering. And it had to be geographically broad to understand the linkages between poverty in one place and wealth in another, and understand that what happened to the poor and vulnerable is linked to the exercise of power, locally and transnationally. For this, he turned to anthropology, history, and sociology, often buttressed by philosophy and a critical epidemiology. He saw these fields as indispensable to social medicine, to understanding health as both a biological and social phenomenon. He referred to these ways of learning, these methods of analysis, as the re-socializing academic disciplines. And we have to remember, engaging in academic analyses of structural drivers of poverty 
and the solutions was not some side gig for our dear friend. This was serious work and required rigorous scholarship, which he modeled. Paul himself wrote and, or edited 17 books and over 400 articles and chapters. And he fostered and encouraged the rest of us to do the same. For him, the quest for health equity would need to be built on foundations that were experienced near, historically deep, morally sound, and that were carefully reasoned. And this is where the academy, as a space for intellectual search and rigorous analysis, plays a critical role. And how did Paul approach this type of intellectual search and rigorous analysis? Well, he grounded the work for equity in a number of ideas that he drew from scholars of liberation theology. At the foundation was a focus on preferential option for the poor. To quote Paul, any serious examination of epidemic disease has always shown that microbes also make a preferential option for the poor. But medicine and its practitioners, even in public health, do so all too rarely, end quote. For Paul, preferential option for the poor was both a moral frame and an epidemiological insight about who gets sick and who dies. It provided, it provided a sound underpinning for the struggle for equity. On top of this, Paul incorporated a methodology that shaped his approach to health equity. Observe, judge, and act. To observe means to observe the social order, the economic and political structures, the cultural practices, and the conditions of those who don't receive care and of those who deny care to others. It is to reveal the mechanisms through which social structures cause misery, to expose structural violence. If observing is done right, to judge means to recognize those mechanisms and take a position on it. It's a type of judgment that implicates and involves the observer. As many of you know, Paul's scholarship was not one of moral relativism. It was one that clearly made normative claims about what is good, what is right, and what is just. And to act means to go beyond the mere reporting of findings, to use the learned insights to change the world, to bend the arc towards equity and justice. And this, Paul often said, could be done through sustained partnerships with service organizations and through accompaniment at various levels of patients, communities, policymakers, and even complex bureaucracies. To observe and judge without action was something he would not accept. Such, such an enterprise, he said, quote, would not be an ethically sound venture. And last, and this is by no means an exhaustive list, Paul learned from the scholars of liberation theology the power of presence and proximity as integral to observation, judgment, and action. I mean, the liberation scholars themselves had lived in communities, listened to communities, and learned from communities in which people were subject to large and small-scale social forces that deprived them of healthcare, housing, and opportunity, and sometimes even life. And as an anthropologist, Paul understood the power of this experience near approach, the power of this type of ethnography. And for him, it provided significant clarity. In a, in a 2018 interview with the Harvard Gazette, Paul was asked if being a clinician and a partisan of patients clouded his objective judgment. Yeah, his response was unequivocal. He said, quote, I think seeing patients unclouds my judgment. Paul's emphasis on observation, judgment, and action reflected his strong conviction that it is possible to grasp, to understand what's happening in the social world, to measure outcomes of great import, and then to use this information to repair the world. But this could only happen if, to paraphrase his words, scholars bring the mechanisms of social processes into relief, expose unsound reasoning, and understand how social forces, how ideologies, work themselves into the lives and bodies of those who are struggling against both disease and poverty. I want to return for a few minutes to Paul's love for Harvard 
and his love of teaching. Students who knew Paul often remembered him telling them that they were his retirement policy. They were the reason he would even consider not working until his last day. In the introduction to a collection of Paul's graduation ceremony speeches called To Repair the World, John Weigel, a graduate of Harvard College who worked closely with Paul, wrote about his realization that students were protagonists in Paul Farmer's vision of a more humane world. This is why Paul put so much time and effort to nourish the soil at Harvard, at Brigham and Women's Hospital, at the University of Global Health Equity in Rwanda, and so many other universities, colleges, and high schools where he visited and taught. And to be fair, it wasn't just students. He saw universities themselves as important change agents in the world, especially Harvard. In one of his recent writings, a reflection on the 150th anniversary of social medicine at Harvard Medical School, Paul outlined a strategy for the future of the department that he had, he had chaired for so many years, global health and social medicine. As I was rereading this piece, I realized that it could be read as a guide or a roadmap for universities in the 21st century. And given the predicament of our world with persistent and corrosive inequality, with climate change, the climate crisis, with the erosion of public trust, and given the, given the predicament of higher education, whose role in addressing the problems of our time as a transformational force in society and as a partner to communities is being increasingly questioned, I believe that Paul's guidance is prescient. This is what he said. Paul called on us to have a singular dedication to integrating varied disciplines, methodologies, and forms of knowledge in order to address disparities in its myriad forms. And certainly in our society and in our world, there is much to do to address poverty, the healthcare crisis, the housing crisis, the climate crisis, the energy crisis, the prison crisis, and so much more. And he called for us to elevate care, including treatment of the sick and caregiving and accompaniment at various levels as urgent moral practices. This should be part of our moral education and the moral frame within which we operate. And he said that we need to engage actively in the pragmatic task of using our knowledge to reduce disparities through research, novel and diverse training programs, and sustained partnerships with service organizations. And of course, he said, we must be driven by the dogged pursuit of equity guided by the lived experience and expertise of communities disproportionately suffering from structural violence in all its forms. That's the roadmap Paul sketched out. And I think Paul would have wanted all universities, but particularly our university, to embrace this. And it echoes what Harvard President Larry Bacow has been saying for many years, that institutions of higher education have a responsibility to work toward making the world fairer and more just. Dear friends, dear colleagues, today we join as a community to honor our friend, Paul, to laud his great contributions, accomplishments, and vision, and to learn more about the intellectual roadmap that he left for us and with us. Paul once said, to be horrified by inequality and early death and not have any kind of plan for responding, that would not work for me. Thanks in large part to Paul, it also does not work for many people who benefited from his scholarship, his teaching, and his example. And as we partake in this afternoon's symposium, we can and should give thanks to Paul for his laser sharp insights and insistence that we do the rigorous work of understanding why inequities persist, and then engage in the rigorous work of repair. Despite the sorrow of his absence, we can only be grateful that our dear friend, the constant gardener who ensured that there was shade for the sick and wary, also nurtured the soil here and in so many places, such that his vision will continue to flourish long beyond his all too short time with us. And I will end today in the brightness of Paul's spirit with a prayer. 
May he rest in peace. May we continue to learn how to observe, judge, and act. And may his memory always be a blessing. Thank you. Thank you, Salman, uh, for an incredibly moving and poignant overview of Paul's extraordinary moral and intellectual legacy. Um, my name is Marty Zeev. I'm an anthropologist and a lecturer in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. From the early years of my graduate program at Harvard, I had the honor to learn from and teach alongside Paul, as well as several of his mentors, colleagues, and friends here today. There is much to say about this experience, but to keep things brief, I'll simply note without overstatement that it has been profoundly life-changing and I am so grateful for it. Um, I was able to read the text of Salman's presentation a few days ago. His recounting of Paul's uh, reparative and transformative work brought to mind a line from Minima Moralia, Reflections of an Undamaged Life, which was written by the German critical theorist Theodor Adorno during a period of exile in the US, to which he fled from the horrors of fascism during World War II. Anguishing over the possibilities for ethical life in the context of a social order built on discriminatory violence and death, he observed, wrong life cannot be rightly lived. When our collective existence is structured in such a way that good for some is extracted from harm uh, against others, um, we are all, in a sense, damaged. To be human is to be bonded together, and the failure to honor those bonds and their moral imperative to care for one another disfigures our shared humanity. In such circumstances, the only path to an ethical life, to right living, for those who benefit from such an order, is to transform it. Paul's life and work illustrates this truth so clearly and insists on its moral entailment through a unique vision of repair. To repair the world, it is not enough to treat the wounds of those harmed by a harmful social order. Paul did plenty of that, certainly, and it was an urgent and central and necessary part of his work. But he also saw, as Salman so beautifully put it, that we must work together to diagnose, dismantle, and remake the material and sociocultural milieu in which humans live and grow and flourish or do not. This, for Paul, is the foundation for a practice of social medicine, care for individuals and communities, reform the social institutions, policies, and power dynamics that inequitably distribute sickness and suffering among humans, prevention and care. His scholarship leaves us with the tools to carry on this work. Over the next few hours, you'll hear from an extraordinary group of Paul's mentors, colleagues, former students, and friends who have worked with him to build and to expand this moral and intellectual legacy. Given its astonishing scope, we will not be able to explore this legacy comprehensively today. Instead, this symposium will be the first in an annual series dedicated to honoring Paul's body of work. The presentations are divided into three discussion panels. Over, uh, the first will examine, examine Paul's elaboration of crucial concepts such as structural violence and immodest claims of causality to unearth and challenge root social causes of global health inequities. The second will explore his use of ethnography and history to re-socialize public health and medicine. And finally, the third will engage with his philosophy of accompaniment and a commitment to making a prefer preferential option for the poor, as these serve as the moral basis of healthcare praxis. Each panel will open with a brief initial reflection, uh, followed by a lengthier presentation, before closing with two shorter reflections. We are so grateful that you have joined us uh, today to celebrate and to expand on Paul's extraordinary moral and intellectual legacy, and to continue his project of repair and transformation. Um, at this time, I warmly invite 
members of the first panel to the stage. Good afternoon. Um, thanks so much, Salman and Marty, for putting together this symposium and for the total honor and a pleasure to uh, offer a brief reflection. In 2005, Paul spoke at the Boston College commencement. His speech was also published in the book Salman and others have referenced to repair the world. In this piece, Paul borrowed from Thomas Clarkson, one of the subjects of Adam Hochschild's brilliant history about the British abolitionist movement. Paul described as turning road angst into action. Clarkson's experience of observing the injustice of slavery, embracing the discomfort that knowledge engendered, and converting that discomfort into abolitionist action. Long before Paul coined the expression, turning road angst into action, he lived the praxis it embodied and used it to build a movement for equity, to act against structural violence and its consequences. Paul recognized early that these social forces were so deeply embedded, ruthlessly protected and promoted, that undermining them required nothing short of a global movement. That movement would only succeed if it embraced the countless ways, or too numerous to count ways, people choose to transform into sustained creative action the agitation that many felt about structural violence and about the lived experience it engenders in its victims. Paul welcomed action against the roots and consequences of structural violence from any and all actors imaginable. These included the obvious ones who could bring direct succor, doctors, nurses, midwives, pharmacists, the less obvious ones, for some, logistic and supply chain experts, social workers, IT professionals, policy wonks, he also welcomed seemingly unlikely allies to the movement, sports management and finance experts, architects, chefs, and of course, Paul invited into the movement a wide array of respected scholars. Paul and many of his esteemed mentors and trainees from whom you'll hear today um, in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine favored social science research that relentlessly exposes the roots of structural violence and represents the lived experience of individuals made vulnerable by these social forces. He also provided a space and unconditional support for my quantitative research to improve access to and the quality of treatment of tuberculosis. My research seeks to, seeks to disrupt a consequence of structural violence, that of resignation or acceptance that each year a long curable, preventable, airborne infectious disease newly sickens more than 10 million people, kills 1.5 million, all while leaving a devastating legacy of new infections, disability, unemployment, starvation, and growing inequality. This work strives to permit people who live with or, at, or at, are at risk of TB to claim their human right to science, a right that is enshrined in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in international law. In other words, and consistent with the early mission statement of PIH, Paul continuously supported my scholarship to grow and harvest for delivery the fruits of research that could be brought to bear on health problems disproportionately affecting the poor. This work began as observational studies of implementation in low and middle income countries of the then standard of care for drug resistant TB. When it evolved to clinical trials in these same settings, Paul's support was unwavering. He could e easily have rejected the work or dismissed it for its reliance on a reductionist model, for any alliance with the pharmaceutical industry, and for its engagement of vulnerable populations in tests of experimental treatments. Although Paul challenged me to confront these issues and to be guided by solidarity with and accountability to the populations we were committed to serving, 
he allowed and even embraced this work as a necessary part of the movement for equity. My colleagues, Joya, Mercedes, and Kim, leaders in the same movement, will discuss their range of scholarship with the common thread of disrupting the sources and consequences of structural violence to ensure a preferential option for the poor. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I just want um, to say that mine is the lengthy one, so don't think I'm just being an air hog. Um, <laughs> Among the enormous contribution of Paul's scholarship was the creation, I believe, of a moral, new and moral framework for the philosophy of human rights. A philosophy that's an amalgam of his great gifts, reading deeply, walking with and listening to the poor, and taking action in concert with his moral understanding. Like Michel Foucault, Paul's philosophy was always linked to an extensive study of history and political economy, these forces that shape the social structures that oppress human beings. He understood Habermas's agency, but he furthered that to elaborate that agency is stolen from the pathologies of power the choices of the powerful. In Paul's philosophy, we understand the Kantian categorical imperative that through reason it is possible to define what is moral and good. But in Paul speak, we call that an AMC, an area of moral clarity. While triangulating with these philosophers, Paul's moral philosophy was always grounded in Catholic social teaching. In Summa Theologica, Thomas Aquinas' tome, he defined morality as both the cognitive ability to understand and render plain areas of moral, moral, moral clarity, excuse me, and the appetitive power, the will to act on this knowledge. However, Setting the stage for this revelatory alchemy of these philosophical themes, Paul's greatest moral teacher, the teacher of human rights, the teacher that we all must listen to, is Haiti. Paul's study of moral philosophy emanated from his love and study of the history and people of Haiti, from his friendships with the country of and people of Haiti, the righteous struggle of the Haitian people for liberty, the historical and present day structures of oppression, and the incisive clarity with which the Haitian poor view the world. These are the cornerstones of Paul's moral philosophy. In his 1994 book, The Uses of Haiti, Paul wrote, the first order of business for citizens of the U.S. might be a candid assessment of our ruinous policies toward Haiti. He went on to call in that book for a new solidarity, a pragmatic solidarity that could supplant both our malignant policies and well-meaning but unfocused charity with what the Haitian people are asking for, justice. Paul's moral philosophy was positioned at the crossroads of health and justice, positioned at the crossroads of a new era of human rights and articulated through a novel and progressive framing of the same. His scholarship shifted the focus away from the, government, from the bread and butter of human rights work, which is blaming and shaming governments for infractions of civil and political rights. He shifted this understanding toward the analysis of the global power structures and their violations of social and economic rights, the right to health care, water, food, housing, and jobs. Paul's proximity to the poor, especially in Haiti, 
gave his cognitive moral understanding the appetitive will to act. As he wrote in 1999 in Pathologies of Power, the destitute sick are increasingly clear on one point. Making social and economic rights a reality is the key goal of health and human rights in the 21st century, which calls for us not only to recognize the relationship between structural violence and human rights violations, but also to implement what we have termed pragmatic solidarity, the rapid deployment of our tools and resources to improve health and well-being of those who suffer this violence. He continues, local and global inequalities mean that the fruits of medical and scientific advancement are stockpiled for some and denied to others. And here we are, 24 years since the publication of Pathologies of Power, a pandemic sweeping the globe and a stockpile of scientific miracles on the shelves of empire. Both in the US and around the world, the risk of contracting COVID-19, the access to preventive vaccines and life-saving therapeutics, and the health outcomes of those who fall sick with COVID-19 map the structural violence of our global society. Black Americans are three times more likely to die of COVID-19. Only 1% of people in Burundi are vaccinated and children of day laborers in India are, are experiencing severe life-threatening malnutrition as we speak. Paul's scholarship on moral philosophy allows us to see around the corner of biomedical victory narratives and understand that social, political, and economic forces result in material, urgent, and violent risks for those who exist in a death world of global racism, gender inequality, and impoverishment. And he has handed us the antidote. In book after book, talk after talk, discussion after discussion, we glean from Paul, do something. Do something. Pragmatic solidarity, he says, the rapid deployment of our tools and resources to improve the health and well-being of those who suffer violence. If Paul's scholarship in anthropology, history, political economy represent what Aquinas called the cognitive moral power then pragmatic solidarity is his antidote for this appetitive moral power or a will to act based on a rational understanding of this broken world. Social medicine from the late 20th century onward will be shaped by the moral philosophy of Dr. Paul Farmer. By promoting deep scholarship that delves into why understanding why the world is the way it is, using historical and political analyses, a never-ending, fascinating, and often heartbreaking discipline, one which is critical for moral reason. What were the uses of Haiti? From the U.S. military occupation in the 20s to the U.S.-backed coup d'etat of President Aristide, and how do these events impoverish and sustain poverty in that country. By using the tools of anthropology, listening, observing, and even shutting up when need be, upon understanding that a mother of, of seven has two sacks of maize until the next harvest, we can understand that taking medicine isn't the first thing on her mind. As Paul wrote in his 1992 book, AIDS and Accusations, AIDS was the last thing. Survival is the first. Thus, in constructing a hierarchy of human rights, we must put food, shelter, employment, and water, jobs, as the first things, the fundamental rights. And by the appetite of reason, the will to act, the practice of social medicine, the pragmatic solidarity, 
Paul's extraordinary canon has many approaches, but I will mention two, accompaniment and poser. From liberation theology and his friend Gustavo Gutierrez, Paul framed the work of social medicine and health equity as making a preferential option for the poor. That is, based on the understanding of historical forces and oppression, working with the poorest shall always be our AMC, our area of moral clarity, a rational choice based on reason. Approach one is accompaniment, walking with, listening to, and seeing the needs of the poor. Shoe leather philosophy, if you will. And approach two is human rights itself, is poser, what we call the program on social and economic rights. It's a program at Partners in Health to provide food, school, housing, and jobs to the destitute sick, to materially resource the human rights violations that are keeping them poor and sick, to a material resource, that which increases the risk of illness, the delay in care, and indeed the life or death of the poor. What Paul recognized is that the social and economic rights are the social determinants of health. And without attention to these, there can be no health equity. Giving food to the hungry, housing the outcast, giving water to the thirsty are areas of moral clarity. They are material works of pragmatic solidarity, and they will deliver the outcome of health equity when paired with modern medicine. The moral philosophy of our dear friend, colleague, and inspiration, Dr. Paul Farmer, is living and breathing. It lives in the students he trained in the United States, in Haiti, and Rwanda, and around the world. These students who now read Foucault and Weber, Fanon, Kashavji, Brandt, Kleinman, Good, and of course, Farmer. It lives in doctors and nurses who have learned to walk with community members, community health workers, patients, accompanying one another, listening and learning about how and when pragmatic solidarity is needed. It lives through holistic programs for housing, food, jobs, access to healthcare around the world from Haiti to Navajo, Kazakhstan to Rwanda. Paul's moral philosophy is a philosophy for the 21st century. It is one, if we follow it, that can allow us to achieve health equity through deep scholarship, understanding, and action. May we all fight for a better and more just world in this vision. Good afternoon. My name is Mercedes Becerra. I am a professor at Harvard Medical School and a senior epidemiologist with Partners in Health. My thanks to the organizers for this opportunity to celebrate our brother Paul. I will add my, recollect, my reflection of one key contribution of Paul's that blew open multiple lines of inquiry for his students, including me, to pursue, and we did. Today, I'll take you back, oh, 27 years, to 1995, to the sandscape of hills and shanty towns of northern Lima in Peru. It was early days as our small alliance of Americans and Peruvians, led by Dr. Jim Young Kim, was figuring out how we might best bring the spirit of Zami La Sante in Haiti to Peru. And it soon became clear that we would be fighting tuberculosis, as was the team in Haiti that was already a decade deep in that fight. In Lima, it was Dr. Jaime Bayona who visited local health centers and gathered anecdotal reports that many patients had recently died while receiving treatment for tuberculosis, or TB. This did not make sense because curative TB treatment had been discovered almost 50 years earlier, and Peru's TB program was recognized as one of the best. Yet many patients we interviewed recounted how they had already lost family members to this disease. So what was happening? 
Here's the crux. For TB medicines, TB antibiotics to work to cure you, the TB bacteria in your body need to be susceptible or killable by those particular drugs. If TB bacteria are not susceptible to being killed by a drug, they are said to be resistant to that drug. And in Lima, in interview after interview, we heard a recurring story. Persons who were sick with drug-resistant forms of TB were being given treatments that could not cure their form of TB. These treatments, called short-course regimens, were effective against TB bacteria that were susceptible to the drugs in those regimens. But the same drug regimens or combinations could not kill the TB bacteria that had already developed resistance to those drugs. A different set of drugs was needed and could cure people infected with resistant TB, but at that moment, these other drugs were not available in the country. And there was an additional pernicious outcome to receiving the incorrect treatment for TB. An incorrect treatment often made the TB bacteria resistant to more drugs, so they became even harder to treat. Because TB is an airborne disease, these highly drug-resistant strains were slowly spreading in families and communities. And those new cases were also being given the incorrect treatments, and so on. In the patient stories that we heard, Paul saw a pattern emerge. The sequence of incorrect treatments with deadly outcomes that multiplied harm. And he soon began to call it the amplifier effect of short course regimens. At first, I did not understand why Paul wanted us to use this term that he just coined, the amplifier effect of short course regimens. In the literature, there were already other terms that could be used for what we were observing. For example, the term acquired resistance was common and seemed straightforward enough, as in a patient picked up more resistance while receiving the incorrect treatment, so acquired resistance. But Paul argued that these other terms were inadequate and even injurious. They led all too easily to blaming the patient. If you don't take your medicines correctly, you are the one causing your treatment failure and worsening resistance. Jim shared the same type of story from people in prison in Russia. This was evident in the stories we heard. In Lima, patients were being admonished to stick to incorrect treatments that had already failed their family members. Essentially, in Peru and many countries outside North America and Europe, public sector TB programs were delivering the wrong treatments to a small proportion of TB patients because the correct treatments would cost more and would not fit into the TB program's minimalist budget. Remember, this was the era of structural adjustment, when many governments were cutting public sector spending in order to pay back old and unfair loans under the pressure of international finance agencies. And public health guidelines followed lockstep with the logic of cost reduction. Cutting costs was seen as the rational path, regardless of what would happen to some small proportion of TB patients that turned out to be millions around the world. The logic was that those unfortunate people already sick with resistant TB would die off. And until then, most did, but not before spreading more resistant TB. Indeed, Paul's use of the amplifier effect of short course regimens pushed the explanatory process away from blaming the individual patient. Paul's term gave clarity that what we were observing in the story of each patient was merely the sharp end of the spear. These regimens had been designed and elevated to policy in circles far from the shantytown. By naming the regimen itself as an amplifier, this could bring the whole spear into relief. This was a way of seeing that helped us simultaneously zoom out to link the harm at the sharp end to the mechanisms along the whole spear. The routinized use of the wrong medicines, the short course regimens, were creating more deadly strains of TB bacteria. And while these bacteria appeared to be the proximal cause of organ damage, illness, and untimely deaths, the harm was the product of forces more distal. To understand and explain what was happening at that sharp proximal end of the spear, we had to follow the links to the geographically and temporally distal decisions and policies and institutions that could be traced as the sources of this harm. Paul then wrote reams about our team's experience, including the amplifier effect. And this lens brought clarity in those early days to our small team of young scholars and clinicians, unequipped as we were to process our own grief and outrage. Paul gave us a method to witness, to see what was there in the stories the patients told us. 
and now we could document how a routinized harm was being produced and reproduced. In Lima in 1995, night after night, when there was electricity, we poured over the clinical narratives, the medical records, and the lab test results, and then we aggregated these stories of patients and families. This way, we were able to delineate, in all its gory detail, the harm being produced at the sharp end, while keeping in view the political and economic mechanisms that could also be seen with Paul's capacious lens of the amplifier effect. This lens was a foundational contribution that seeded multiple research programs that are still going strong. Thank you, Polo, for this singular lens, for your way of seeing. It will continue to inspire the movement that is fighting for access to the best possible treatment for every child and every adult infected with tuberculosis. Thank you. Thank you all for being with me here today. Um, so we can collectively pause to honor Paul Farmer's life, work, and his enduring impact on all of us. My name is Kim Sue, and I'm an assistant professor of medicine at Yale, where I'm an internist, an addiction medicine doctor, an anthropologist, and a researcher. I was until recently the medical director of the National Harm Reduction Coalition, which is a nonprofit dedicated to improving the health dignity and well-being of people who use drugs. I've taken care of patients at Rikers Island Jail System in New York City, as well as worked at methadone clinics and needle exchange programs, providing low threshold treatment for people with substance use disorders. Like so many of you, I consider myself part of Paul's vast tree of influence, and his writing and work directly inspired me to come to Harvard to pursue social medicine and anthropology in 2007. I, like so many thousands of us, would not be doing what I am doing without Paul's inspiration and the foundational work of our mentors and friends at the Harvard Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. But I am one of several students of Paul's that took his vision of equity and justice directly to sites of concentrated violence and injustice, but within the United States itself. In particular, using his approaches to think about and critically examine the US jail and prison system, while Paul had worked on TB and HIV in Siberian prisons and beyond, I wanted to think through the structural violence and institutional racism of the existing carceral system in the US and the long-standing failures of the so-called war on drugs. I think of these structures as enduring icons of American slavery, racial and class injustice and oppression, and systems that perpetuate harm, health inequities, social suffering, and premature death here at home. There is nothing unique or exceptional about applying Paul's work to the US prison system and caring for people who inject drugs, although we are in the midst of the worst overdose death epidemic we have ever faced in this country, with over 108,000 people dead of overdose in the past 12 months, a massive cause of premature and preventable death. However, Paul and I had often discussed the difficulties of doing field work in your own backyard, your own town, in the richest nation in the world, which is still riven with violent inequality. My patients often die young in their 20s, 30s, and 40s, a searing comment on whose lives matter. I've always thought of Paul when I've stepped into the gray zone, facing what I believe is right and what we are told is proper. I've channeled his bravado and energy and the recognition of our immense social privilege when I've carted thousands of doses of naloxone, the opioid overdose antidote, onto planes to redistribute and reallocate a dwindling national supply to get it into the hands of people actively using drugs and their family and friends saving their lives. When I know I am facing bureaucratic indifference, but what I am doing is morally right, I invoke Paul. What would Paul do, I think? When I am sitting on a panel advocating at the White House for funding for syringe service programs and decriminalization of possession of drugs, I am channeling a piece of Paul. In my book, Getting Wrapped, Women, Incarceration, and the American Opioid Crisis, where I use ethnography to follow women who use drugs in and out of the Massachusetts jail and prison systems, I write about Lydia, who barely made it to see me in Harvard's post-incarceration transition clinic after getting out of jail and who was using heroin chaotically. She was over an hour late to her appointment with us and barely got seen. 
I advocated for the clinic to remain open to wait for her, to acknowledge the gargantuan effort amidst the chaos it took to make it to us. Paul once wrote for us to think about who gets to be your patient, who makes it to you, who is so lucky. He urged us to innovate, to think about those who don't get there, those who don't get to be your patient. So many of my patients who use drugs say they would rather die than face the violence, stigma, and criminalization they experience in hospitals at the hands of our colleagues. I am constantly admonishing these colleagues who are steeped in our culture's hostility towards people who use drugs, but at the same time, in the spirit of Paul, I attempt to demonstrate and model new ways of caring through harm reduction practices and principles, meeting people where they are and not leaving them there. And still, our patients are dying, and we are not reaching enough people. Lydia told me that the reason it took her so long sometimes to reach me was she traveled in back alleys to avoid encountering police because she had open warrants. The carceral threat of criminalization, surveillance, and social control, the everyday structural violence of being a person who injects drugs in the United States, it often prevented her from accessing life-saving care. When Lydia died of an overdose several months later, I recognized it as a social, clinical, and policy failure it was, in part because of Paul's work. It marks my heart and is one of the reasons why I continue to advocate so strongly for overdose prevention centers, among other basic necessities for people who use drugs, addressing the upstream conditions of harm so that the most vulnerable people can access dignity, respect, compassion, and live to be and remain our patients. I am chastened with how easy he and Partners in Health made it look to have a preferential option for the poor, but still, despite all their hard work, how hard it is to ensure material conditions for flourishing, how to get the, quote, staff, stuff, space, and systems needed to slow or stop epidemics, even and especially here in the U.S. I just got my bivalent COVID booster yesterday, and still one billion people around the world remain unvaccinated. And according to the WHO, we have seen 6,518,749,000 COVID deaths worldwide. Paul's prescription for us was, in his words, to have, quote, a modicum of investment, a larger dose of social justice, and attention to the needs of those already sick or injured. We are urged on to do this work, achieving equity and justice with Paul's roadmap in our hearts and his spirit of critical inquiry in our writing and work. My work towards U.S. prison abolition, research and advocacy in liberatory solidarity, and justice for people who use drugs relies heavily on Paul's guiding principles. With his profound optimism and his moral compass, we can continue forging this path together, a path of social justice, flourishing, and equity for all. Thank you. Mary Jo and I will share the introduction and then pass it along to Adia, who will be doing the first talk, and to Anne and David. 
A few words about ethnography to introduce this session. Ethnography is a mode of being acutely and attentively present, personally present, in a distinctive setting with living individuals, communities. Amanda Gorman recently said that a poem begins with a wound. For Paul, ethnography meant identifying a site of wounding and going there, making himself present and vulnerable, or finding himself in a setting and recognizing it as an uncanny site of wounding, often a site of haunting. Ethnography is a mode of inquiry. It is a way of being present with urgent and difficult questions, a disciplined mode of analysis and writing. For Paul, that meant attention to history and political economy, to histories of inequality of power and resources, histories bearing on the present. Ethnography is also a form of engagement a way of being present with individuals and communities one cannot walk away from, with a setting that demands something be done, be done not just for, but with. Paul did not walk away. He often took up that something to be done, not with optimism, except in that Gramscian sense that Jim talked about, Optimism is often based on evidence and a calculus that things will be better. But for Paul, with a profound sense of hope, a deep commitment that went beyond any evidence that things would be better. Paul the physician was always an ethnographer. And Paul the ethnographer was always a physician. For Mary Jo and me, Paul was always our student, and yes, we also thought he was our retirement policy. And he honored us as his teachers. He was always our colleague and made us fellow travelers um, in what we were doing. Paul was our friend in the deepest sense, and Paul was always our teacher. Paul, the physician, activist, ethnographer, was always a teacher in particular for young physicians around the world, with whom he had a special way of being present. An acute ethnographer of local worlds of medicine, critical, of course, he engaged young doctors in creating new ways of providing health care for the poor. In an interview I did with Paul and Dr. Christoph Millian, one of Haiti's renowned OBGYN surgeons, in May of 2020, Paul said he invested, and he, this is a quote, in the young talent, new medical graduates waiting to serve by caring for hundreds of patients, patients in partnership with them especially during intense periods of social unrest, murders, kidnappings, coup, political violence, and ultimately earthquake disasters. He inspired and became a role for many, teaching by doing, connecting with patients. Paul's goal and efforts to quote him was to save these young doctors from cynicism, a loss of enthusiasm, a belief in the profession. It led many to return over the years to continue the partnership forged when they were young, joining in building and staffing the University Hospital at Mirabale, where Paul said, where the action was, where the promise was. Clinical teaching was, Paul's, was one of Paul's greatest joys. Dr. Millian recently reflecting on 22 years of Paul being his professor, said Paul oriented my analysis, my thinking, my writing, my empathy, compassion, 
relationships and communications with pa patients, the way I teach social medicine, my critical thinking, and scientific curiosity. He makes me think that nothing is impossible to save my patient's life. Yet he helped me to cultivate humility. Thank you, that was beautiful. Um, hi, my name is Adia Benton. I am an associate professor of anthropology and African studies at Northwestern University. And I'm gonna give you a title so that you'll know the theme. Um, this paper is called uh, Reading, Reading with Paul. Um, and, and it'll be clear why, I think. But earlier this year, in the midst of a geeky text conversation with Paul about Evans Pritchard and the Azande people of South Sudan, I wrote, I think I have ADHD. All the tools that I used to manage my disordered executive function were no longer working as I struggled to finish a book about Ebola in Sierra Leone. The Azande story I was telling him was one in a string of many diversions. And he quickly responded to me, I know I have ADHD, but I can read gangbusters. Paul was a prolific writer, as anyone who's waded through the drafts of his 100-page chapters knows. But he was also an avid reader. If there's such thing as a prolific reader, he would have been counted among them because his readings have been productive in the sense that his reading practice played a central role in his ethnographic analysis of biosocial phenomena. The practice of reading and rereading formed the foundation of his robust anthropological scholarship, which incorporated history, political economy, and clinical medicine, as you've heard from many people today. And he turned that into ethnographic analyses and political action. Paul used to say, I'm an anthropologist anytime I am awake. His orientation toward the world, his clinical practice, his vision of public health came from intensive study of social theory, human experience, and, and particularly illness experience and experiences of suffering, of liberation theology, of course, as many of you have heard. Um, and he also said, you know, I was, I was poor. <laughs> the handful of times I saw him on the eve of accepting some prestigious award, he'd say, not bad for a cracker from Florida, huh? And while it might be appealing to narrow his legacy to a desire to cure the world, as in the title of, subtitle of the Kidder biography, Paul's moral and intellectual legacy and praxis extend well beyond that. I first met him in 1997 when I was an undergraduate at Brown. He'd been invited to speak in a class that I would later teach at the same university 15 years later, AIDS in the International Perspective. He was friends with the course instructors, Pat Simons and Lucille Newman, two women born in the 30s who were also pioneers in medical anthropology and reproductive justice issues. We studied and discussed hundreds of pages of reading per week. Um, we hosted AIDS activists, researchers, and embarked upon projects in the AIDS community service organizations throughout Rhode Island. And, and so in preparation for Paul's visits, our professor professors assigned his work. Paul was in his late 30s, but he had already written and published two books and co-edited a third by the time we hosted him in our classroom. Um, we had to read two of those, of those three books for seminar that week. The first book was AIDS and Accusation, Haiti and the Geography of Blame, where he championed a geographically broad and historically deep approach uh, for interpreting what he called the ethnographically visible dimensions of social and economic life. The second was Women, Poverty, and AIDS, Sex, Drugs, and Sexual Violence, very provocative title, which was co-edited with Janie Simmons and Margaret Connors for the Institute for Health and Social Justice. So um, this is when I explain how bad a student I was. I prioritized studying for my immunology and genetics exam that week, so I did not read those books. During his lecture, Paul discussed women, poverty, and AIDS, which would serve as a manual of sorts as I carried out community work in AIDS service organizations over the coming years. Paul's impetus for writing it was inattention to patriarchy and gender, capitalism and class, racialization, racism in the social science, public health, and clinical literature on AIDS. Paul and his colleagues following the black feminist sociologist Patricia Hill Collins, and yes, he does actually cite her, 
foregrounded an intersectional analysis, which meant examining sexism, racism, and classism together as risk for HIV AIDS, risk factors for HIV. And in so doing, they found victim blaming and the inflation of personal choice or cultural difference, what he called immodest claims of, of causality elsewhere, lying at the root of many research, clinical, and social service programs for HIV prevention and care. Now, a fundamental aim of that book was not only to redress this by writing about and from the perspective, perspectives of poor women affected by the disease, but also to reread and rethink the scholarly literature with care for poor women at the center. And in part, this also meant incorporating poor women's perspectives and their own astute political analyses of the conditions in their communities. A chapter in Women, Poverty, and AIDS, which I think also appears in Infections and Inequalities, features a story of a group of self-described poor women, Haitian women, who in light of high rates of HIV transmission developed an education program during which they showed a video, demonstrated proper condom use, and facilitated community discussions. When they presented their work at a conference in Haiti, a doctor in the audience asked, so what? If we're failing to prevent HIV transmission, what is the significance of your project? And a woman from the group responded, Doctor, when all around you liars are the only cocks crowing, telling the truth is a victory. Telling the truth about the transmission dynamics among poor women not only entailed explicitly intersectional analyses, for Paul and his colleagues, it also meant education for preventing AIDS that would be insufficient if it did not also address sexism and sexuality, if it did not if it did not protect rather than punish sex work and sex workers, if it did not explicitly address poverty, gender inequality, and racism, and if it did not improve clinical care for women. So I wanted to pause here and ask each of you, what truths about our current COVID-19 pandemic, its causes, its prevention, and the mitigation of its effects are our colleagues, many of whom were trained here and worked alongside Paul, what truths are they evading as members, of our, as our members of our communities fall ill, experience its chronic effects, and die prematurely? We have the tools we have been told. As hundreds continue to die every day in this country, you do you, they say. Those of us who mourn Paul, to whom are we accountable when we individualize social problems and desocialize political problems and thus their solutions? As Paul spoke to that class that morning in 1997, I found myself flipping through the its two assigned texts, anxiously seeking out the passages, passages that he referenced. You probably know this strategy when you don't do the reading. Um, <laughs> I approached him after class, and he said to me, what do you want? As if he knew that I had not done the reading. And I said, I want to know more about MDR-TB, <laughs> which, you know, who does that? <laughs> and I said, the social, the social part that you talked about, and the social part to which I referred was obviously the touchstone for his life's work, understanding the social conditions that structure risk for disease and premature death, you know, social epidemiology, embedding in personal, interpersonal encounters in the larger social fields in which such encounters take place and take on their meaning, that's cultural anthropology, and examining the political and economic systems emerging over time and across territories, political economy. His assistant scribbled down my mailing address, and within a few days, I received a stack of photocopied journal articles in my campus mailbox. I began writing in earnest about the treatment of TB patients in New York City, and later took up the topic for a global health course I took in, the first, in my first year of public health school. Researching and writing those papers set me on course for thinking differently about epidemics and what a critical social science, what Paul referred to as the resocializing disciplines, might help me to do as a public health worker and as a scholar. For my later research in writing about AIDS care, support and treatment in Sierra Leone, as well as my research on the Ebola pandemic in West Africa, this has meant unraveling the historic and enduring role of the humanitarian and development industries in shaping health landscapes. This has meant documenting the experiences of people tr tr having trouble accessing care and treatment. And it has meant understanding the racialized character of epidemic response from the colonial era forward that prioritizes containment of disease over the provision of care. 
that the protection of local and global elites over the provision of care, and the circulation of capital and the accumulation of wealth over the provision of care. A couple of years after our first meeting, Paul and I met again, this time at an APHA meeting in Boston. In a dynamic that would persist well into our friendship, Paul held my arm as I walked with him to a car that would be taking him to an airport. Within days of returning home to Atlanta, I emailed him, still pondering my future work. And of course, he recommended more reading. This time, he told me it helped him to have social theories that provide a moral and ethical anchoring for his work. Of course, you've heard this. Liberation theology is where he had found that anchor, and he recommended two texts, Boff and Boff's Introduction to Liberation Theology and Gustavo Gutierrez's A Theology of Liberation. During a conversation with Roberto Guezet Zueta uh, at Boston College's uh, School of Theology back in 2013, Paul explained the intellectual and spiritual debt to liberation theology's preferential option for the poor, and he said that liberation theologians have some very powerful ideas that could help us understand epidemics, whether you're talking about Boston or elsewhere. I've never been to a place where the idea of a preferential option for the poor was not illuminating or useful. Again, it was a central idea not only for his clinical practice and advocacy, but also in his role as an ethnographer. As he wrote in the book he co-authored with Gutierrez, a copy of which he left in my office with an inscription and a note, an understanding of poverty must be linked to efforts to end it. Father Gustavo has often, Gustavo has often noted in his writing and in his speaking that poverty means death. The study of poverty without an expressed concern with ending it is seen with the hermeneutic of suspicion by most of the people with whom I've lived and worked. A preferential option for the poor informs our clinical work and also our efforts to move beyond individual patients to remedy inadequacies, inefficiencies, and gaps in health systems. The other important concepts from liberation theology guiding the work were an embodied practice of accompaniment, of pragmatic solidarity against structural violence, a phrasing he borrowed from peace studies scholar Johann Galtung to describe the large-scale and e uh, and social and economic structures in which affliction is embedded. In his attempts to further struct uh, theorize structural violence, Paul argued that the concept is intended to inform the study of the machinery of oppression. Oppression is a result of many conditions, not the least of which reside in consciousness. And of course, he faced some pushback amongst his anthropologist interlocutors, seeking more precise conceptual language for the various forms of violence experienced by the poor. And you can read that in, I think, current anthropology, uh, anthropology of structural violence. And in some ways, this criticism misses the point, a point that Paul made by writing copious, sometimes snarky footnotes, index, interest, index entries, <laughs> and very long, meticulously documented books. No single social theory or methodology, no devotion to analytic parsimony that a single theory might offer us is adequate for explaining and ultimately defeating the sinful structures in which we are all enmeshed and often help to reproduce. Nevertheless, structural violence must be named. Again, I want to address the national response to the current pandemic in which we find ourselves, using uh, Paul's words, also with a nod to the Azande cosmology with which I began. We will therefore need to examine as well the roles played by the erasure of historical memory and other forms of desocialization as enabling conditions of structures that are both sinful and ostensibly nobody's fault. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Ann Becker. I'm a professor of global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. And um, I want to start by saying it's a great honor to join my esteemed colleagues in paying tribute to the moral and intellectual legacy of Paul's, <clears throat> excuse me, of Paul Farmer, and in particular to offer a brief additional comment in response to Professor Benton's erudite and moving remarks. 
Knowledge production was at the heart of Paul's project to repair the world. And ethnography was his preferred mode of producing knowledge. Indeed, much of his transformative analytic work, from his first book to his last, is built on the sturdy empirical foundation of rigorous ethnographic scholarship. For Paul, ethnographic data were also deployed as a corrective, a rebuttal to dominant explanatory narratives in global health, public health. Ethnography, a methodologic lever to be pulled to critique or rescue overly reductive analyses that featured in the words of one of his signature phrases in Mata's claims of causality. With experience near data and richly contextualized formulation, he's, he sought to enlarge the scope of inquiry and understanding. And especially, relentlessly, he meant to upend the narrow view of resource scarcity as a fixed and terminal condition, as if it were a given that could not be undone by the same social structural forces that birthed it. It needs to be said that Paul was equally ready to critique reductive analyses issuing from ethnographic work, debunking unsupported culturalist formulations that were not just inaccurate, but also dangerous in obscuring actionable social structural determinants of poor health. He pointed out rightly that culture was overworked as an explanatory variable and cautioned against sweeping it into a narrative of convenience or contrivance. Deeply interested in people, their lives, and lived experience, Paul's brilliance as an ethnographer, his unparalleled skill and discernment of the dynamics of poor health and the inroads he could make with therapeutic, social, and scholarly intervention, stemmed from his capacity to listen and his abiding commitment to presence and accompaniment. The scope of Paul's analysis was more panoramic and complex than ethnography alone could encompass. And Paul, a cosmopolitan and intrepid scholar, brought the tools of historical analysis, lots of other tools too, from <laughs> liberation theology, political economy, epidemiology, etc. He brought these to bear toward limiting the social structural pathogens that entrench poverty, poor health, and other forms of suffering. And to be clear, knowledge production was never the end game that Paul had in mind for his work. Rather, his goal was to produce knowledge that could be trained toward translational purpose, toward a path for redress. Like Professor Benton, I think often of the impression Paul made on me when we first met in the fall of 1983, when Paul was an applicant to HMS who, like me and Jim Kim too, hoped to study anthropology in a joint MD-PhD program that was just being rolled out. And I was a first-year student dispensing my wisdom to Paul. <laughs> that was not an era for the field of anthropology when scholars or students were generally encouraged to fashion their scholarship for translational use. I told Paul so. And when he averred that he certainly would not be attending any doctoral program that frowned on applied work, I remember how worried I was for his future in the field. <laughs> Paul did matriculate the following year, which made us something like academic siblings. And to press the analogy, I worried not just about Paul and his future, but also that he was going to get us into trouble with our academic parents. But the story ended differently, and quite well, as you already know. Thank goodness for that, and for many of us who were inspired by his example to reimagine and sharpen our work for translational impact. Paul's moral authority rested in no small measure on his rigorous scholarship, which laid the unshakable foundations of his analyses. This scholarship, in turn, laid groundwork that transformed the field of global health and certainly transformed his grateful colleagues. Alongside his commitment to illuminate the social roots of sickness and attendant misery, 
Rand Paul's commitment to pragmatic action in the present and to social change and redress of the unconscionable burden of suffering in the future. Paul never lost sight of this purpose. From one book to the next, a conversation he started with us in AIDS and Accusation and continued through fevers, feuds, and diamonds, stretched across continents, centuries, and pandemics, and carried health equity as its through line and purpose. To close, I underscore the transformative legacy of Paul's ethnographic work. Not just in what it is, which is gripping and rendering the context of lived experience, incisive in its analyses, and persuasive in its plain spoken eloquence. Not just in what it does, in re-socializing our understanding of pathogenic forces, and then teaching, cajoling, exhorting, and infusing us with righteous optimism that a path to health equity can be found. But also, importantly, in how it calls, how it calls to this generation, to future generations, to all of us gathered to honor him today, to finish this work. And we will, with all my gratitude for his legacy. My name is David Jones, and I was one of Paul's many students who became a colleague with him in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. We are all remembering and celebrating Paul today for many reasons. One reason that has not yet been discussed is his prowess as a historian. Some of you will be surprised to hear me say this. We all know that Paul was famous as a physician, anthropologist, visionary, and humanitarian. But as a historian? Let me make the case. In 2015, in October, I flew with Paul to Dubai for the grand opening of the Center for Global Health Delivery. While waiting between flights in an airport lounge, he reached into his tote bag and pulled out a file. You have to see this, he said. He had found the ship's log from the Mantua, a British cruiser during World War I that had sailed from Plymouth, England to Freetown in Sierra Leone in August 1918. It was likely this ship that introduced influenza to Sierra Leone, sparking an epidemic that quickly spread throughout West Africa. Paul was delighted that you could find archival evidence like this to support his arguments about the toxic connections between imperialism, political economy, inequality, and infectious disease. By 2015, I was no longer surprised to encounter Paul's love of history. Even though he had come to Harvard to study medicine and anthropology, his curiosity was immense. In his first year at Harvard Medical School, he was introduced to history of medicine by Alan Brandt. Their encounter had a lasting impact on Paul's thinking. You can see this in his earliest work. AIDS and accusation is full of history. Paul narrated the emergence of AIDS in Haiti, a history he himself had witnessed. He showed how the local community in Kanj had been displaced and impoverished when a hydroelectric dam project had flooded their valley in 1956. He argued repeatedly that you could not function in Haiti, either as an ethnographer or as a physician, if you did not understand Haitian history, from its conquest to its plantations, slavery, revolution, reparations, American military interventions, and survival. When Paul began to work in Rwanda in 2005, he knew that he had to study the long history of colonization and genocide there. When he began to work in Liberia and Sierra Leone in 2014, he took a deep dive into their histories as well. It was this curiosity that had led him to the captain's log from 1918. And his historical analyses are on dramatic display in his last book, Fevers, Feuds, and Diamonds. The four historical chapters are the longest section of that book. He convincingly shows how the long history of colonization, extractive capitalism, war, and medical neglect 
had left the local communities susceptible to Ebola. As he was writing this book, he often sent me draft chapters, 100-page draft chapters, uh, to make sure that he had gotten this history right. I offered whatever advice that I could, but he knew far more about West African history than I did. Paul's scholarship, in turn, had a profound impact on my own work and on all of my colleagues. My dissertation examined the epidemics that assailed indigenous communities during the European conquest of the Americas. I always thought of my work as an attempt to take Paul's anthropological insights about structural violence, social suffering, and infectious disease, and apply them to a historical case study. Many scholars have argued that American Indians had been genetically destined to die in great numbers from the diseases that Europeans introduced into the Americas. I pushed back against this, inspired by Paul. Indigenous Americans had not been born vulnerable to epidemics. Instead, they had been made vulnerable by the devastation, chaos, and suffering of European colonization. My own writings prompted many conversations with Paul about our shared historical interests. He often wanted updates from me about the latest historical or archaeological research about the demographic of Hispaniola in the 1490s and 1500s. We repeatedly discussed the competing claims that have been made by researchers about whether Haiti or the United States had first exposed the other to HIV. We debated whether the high rates of hypertension that Paul had found in Haiti could be attributed to the people's histories of slavery and forced labor. As you've heard many times today, Paul always had a knock for capturing complex ideas with clever slogans. He would often talk about immodest claims of causality or the space, staff, stuff, and systems that are required for good medical care. To explain his ideas about biosocial analysis, he told people to look around and to look behind. As Byron had said, to examine both the, politi the political economy of a community and its history. Historical analysis was always an essential part of his thinking, not only because he had deep curiosity about the people with whom he worked, but also because he knew that historical insight could inform and motivate the interventions that communities need. History, like anthropology, could be applied productively to healthcare delivery. And I will always be grateful for, to Paul for demonstrating this so well. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Jamaica Kincaid. Uh, I am the only person um, in this whole group of people who uh, uh, didn't know Mr. Farmer, Dr. Farmer, at, at all, except the way you know someone important and uh, um, wonderful. So I can't say Paul 
did this and Paul and I did that. But um, I, I am th thinking that uh, 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 in some ways I, I am the ideal person um, to say something uh, about him uh, um, uh, because so much of uh, uh, the love he had for the world and the wanting to heal the world would have been directed uh, uh, at someone like me. Um, uh, 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 I, I come from a place uh, in the world where, when I was a child, a person like Dr. Farmer would have been an especially welcome presence in my life. Uh, I'm often described by people as uh, growing up in, in tropical poverty, and the example they will give is um, that I had no, I grew up without uh, running water in my house, central plumbing, or um, electricity. And uh, sometimes, if I feel like annoying them, I will say, well, neither did Queen Victoria. Um, but then sometimes I'm just quiet. I don't say anything. Let them say that. Um, but I, I, I did grow up in, in, in poverty, though um, what that would mean, um, perhaps this is an example uh, of the poverty I uh, grew up with. I had measles, whooping cough, and typhoid fever all before I turned seven. Um, one after the other, and I survived them. I saw children uh, my age um, die. I was in hospital, and they, they died. And I could tell they had died because a screen was drawn around their crib. Uh, no screen was drawn around uh, my crib. Um, but then I had a small scratch on my shin, uh, that wouldn't heal, and it eventually became uh, the sore, a sore the size of a penny, a British size penny. It then began to behave like a little volcano, growing in depth, changing colors, red, pink, yellow, uh, erupting, subsiding, uh, and no, no one knew what to do about it. There was no doctor that I could be taken uh, to see about uh, this uh, changing thing on my shin um, that sometimes was so deep you could almost see the bone. Um, uh, my poor mother uh, uh, was torn between blaming herself for not uh, protecting me from evil spirits that had been set upon us by someone who envied me, uh, in, in particular for my stellar performance in school, or, or someone who envied her because she was the only woman my stepfather had married. That is the only woman with whom he had children and had married. He had many children with many women, and um, for some reason he married her. Um, on the other hand, she believed and could see the imperial penny-sized wound uh, I had on my shin might bear being attended to by a doctor. And so every other afternoon, I went to a clinic where the wound was looked at by a nurse uh, who would swab it with cotton soaked in iodine, then gentian violet, and bandage it up and send me home. And this went on uh, uh, three times a week I saw her. Monday afternoons after school, Wednesday afternoons after school, Friday afternoons after school. Nothing happened to the wound. It went this way, that way. Uh, and then... Um, uh, one day it 
glistened, it grew a scab, again like a volcano, it glistened and the glistening uh, grew less and less and uh, then it was healed, the scab fell away and then I had uh, just a pink flesh that then turned to the usual colour uh, of my brown skin. Um, uh, this sore was, that was so worrying, once it healed, it was forgotten by everyone except me uh, because I can still see uh, the scar every day. Uh, as I say, I did not know of a doctor farmer or that there could be such a thing as a doctor farmer, a person who uh, would... Uh, not just go out of his way, but go out of, of his own self to think of someone like me or the many people who look like me. Um, as I say, I know of him because I read, I read about him in, in, in newspapers. I took a special interest in him whenever I saw something about him because, I, again, I was reminded of my childhood and uh, all the people I grew up with um, who would um, die of things that, you know, something people would die of easily is something called a goiter. It was well known you shouldn't have a goiter operation because you would never come out of it. Um, but I can see that if there was a Dr. Farmer in our lives, we would have come out of it. Um, his interest, I want to say, of, of healing, um, his love for people who were wounded um, uh, or who suffered wounds that they had not caused themselves uh, and did not know how to speak of the people who, who caused them, um, touched me uh, in, again, the way I came to know him in this, in this public way. And uh, I sincerely regret not being able to, to thank him. Um, not that it would have mattered. Um, so here we are celebrating the life of this good man. We are sad but also we have a kind of joy because he added so much to, our, to lives, my own, even though as I say I, 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 I didn't know him. Um, but speaking personally, uh, well, I am always speaking personally, so um, I, I am um, filled with a little bitterness at life uh, in general um, and I hope you'll allow, forgive me if I'm uh, but when I, I I don't remember exactly where I was but I heard of him dying and I it was, of course, sad, immediately sad, and, and then also uh, uh, very angry, um, because it was another reminder of the unfairness of, of uh, the thing called death, that it, it, it seems um, as if it, it ought to, death ought to have some feeling of you know, the weight of things. Well, should it be Dr. Farmer or should it be Henry Kissinger? Uh, that you and I know who we would choose if it came to that. Um, or, you know, the man, uh, a person like Dick Cheney who could live without a heart. Uh, for a very long time until someone gave him a heart and he has a heart and then there's Dr. Farmer. These are the things that cross my mind as I uh, was thinking of, of that sad 
um, day. Um, and then, of course, last week, or maybe it was two weeks ago, when a, a, a woman who um, was the face of the most successful criminal organization in the world, the British Empire, lived to be 96. Uh, that seemed incredibly unfair. Um, I told you these events, uh, th this event brought up uh, bitterness uh, and the unfairness. Um, but then uh, I end with gratitude for however short a time uh, Dr. Farmer was with us. Um, we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, it's a singular honor to be here with you all to celebrate the life and work of Dr. Paul Farmer, to keep on keeping on, as Brian Stevenson mentioned this morning. I am João Biel, and I'm a professor of anthropology at Princeton University, where I also direct the Brazil Lab. Will they show the image? Okay, great. Okay, great. Okay. The trick of the world, its secret and its truth, is that it is the fountain of all things. The analytical task before us is to contain at least the most important part of that messy complexity and contingency. The pain and the pleasures, the sorrows and joys, the desires and remembrances, and sometimes the catastrophe. These are some of the last words Paul Farmer inscribed for us in the foreword for the book, Ark of Interference, Medical Anthropology for Worlds on Edge, honoring the work of our mentor, Arthur Kleinman. Words that guide my thoughts here. In the wake of the catastrophe of his untimely death, Paul's own Ark of Interference always keenly aware of power and privilege, and with an uncompromising bent towards care and justice, accompanies us, probes us, keeps us on edge. The challenge of translating into words the world's seemingly effortless trick, he writes, which means fixing the flux into local and time-bounded descriptions and understanding shields some and exposes others. Many would speak of raging torrents rather than of refreshing wellsprings. Whether faced with fountain or flood, the way we know the world is through lived experience, the humanist continues. What could be more mundane, more worldly, than the fate of each one of us when faced with the fact of our own mortality? Paul certainly thought a lot about what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. meant when he said, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhumane. In the face of life's onslaught, and its highly unequal currents of illness, injury, and finitude, Paul's moral philosophy is deeply ethnographic, relentlessly relational and defiantly open. It always starts in the midst of variable social worlds and myriad friendships, as we have witnessed throughout the day. It detonates boundaries and sustains a mysteriousness to existence then and now, tut moon se moon, every person is a person. There's always a time when reason fails us, 
an unexpected or protected illness, the untimely passing of a loved one, a destroyed home, the violence of being too poor and without a right to health. Trust in life is gone. Why me? Why now? Who cares? Where to? Questions that death in all its forms poses to the afflicted and that science cannot disappear. We are not machines, after all. In pain, we seek others. We pray for relief. We want language. We plot a hereafter. As Poles and Partners in Health Praxis has forcefully and creatively demonstrated time and again, the political and ethical becomes incarnate in the bodies, mobilities, and desires of each person. In his words, even at its most interior, experience is always social, lived out within local worlds, enmeshed not only in physical bodies, but also in broader and cosmopolitan social webs than cells spun into global assemblages. As mentioned before, this historically deep and geographically broad moral philosophy knows that diseases themselves make a grim and preferential option for the poor. Against a politics of neglect, it thus responds to what needs attention, investment, and work, implicating us all in our various roles, challenging our capacity to listen, to speak truth to power, and to build practical solidarities at our own ethical peril. Otherwise, as Angela Davis powerfully says, the refusal or inability to do something, say something, when a thing needs doing or saying is unbearable. That we were approaching worlds on the edge has served as a premise for much of the past decades of social science, in which inequality, violence, and uncertainty have enveloped lives. Exhaustion and anomie have been deeply felt on the edges of autocracy and predatory capitalism, of infrastructural breakdown and slow and abrupt forms of climate crisis, mediated by extreme populism, war, disinformation, and state and corporate efforts to dismantle meaningful, though piecemeal, agendas of socioeconomic rights. Today, we find ourselves past a stage of foreboding. How then do we enlanguage these times and interfere in and shift their course, attentive not only to the massive scale of vulnerability, affliction, and death that has come into view, but also to the efforts across continents of people struggling to care for one another and to make sense of suffering and alter its horizons. For as Paul has always insisted, escapes, surprising escapes, and alternative forms of conviviality emerge alongside newfangled scales of harm, and anthropology and medicine must be open to people's theodicy and seize this stubborn, careful will to create community. In the land of the living, sick or injured people seek care, and caregiving is central to the journey. Caregiving begins before death and reliably extends well beyond it. We hear you, Paul. With his moral, philosophical lantern always in hand, Paul would expose the socializing nature of abstract prescriptions and speak against the myopic idea that expertise alone will save you. It won't. And much like the luminous political economist Albert Hirschman, he too advocated for the inalienable right of every person and nation to a non projected future. That is, the possibility of something more and something wonderful, his words. Accompaniment, which comes from the Latin ad cum panis, which is one way of saying breaking bread together, is the embodiment of this vital vision that many 
this morning and this afternoon evoked. To accompany someone, Paul says, is to go somewhere with them, to break bad breath together, to be present on a journey. There's an element of mystery and openness. I will share your fate for a while. Accompaniment, he adds, is much more often about sticking with a task until it's deemed complete by the person being accompanied rather than by the accompaniateur. Accompanying people in central Haiti in the fight for water, wood, food, and medicines, the young Paul took practical spiritual and intellectual solace in the liberation theology of Father Gustavo Gutierrez to be with the poor on a journey away from scarcity, suffering, and premature and stupid death. There's also a deep material underpinning to the idea of accompaniment, as people's sense of home spread beyond the immediate domicile. The laku, a subaltern form of land management and housing, common in rural Haiti, and that resisted the return of the plantation, must have informed Paul's thinking here. In a laku, a set of houses are linked by a yard with a ritual space where multi-generational families work cooperatively and provide for each other and care for their dead. Accompaniateurs, the communal structures, and the multi-generational values of Laku that survived one displacement after the next are partners in health. In its elasticity and bold scaling up, this practice vision of presence with others and unconditional caregiving has profoundly challenged the inequities of hegemonic aid models, redefined the boundaries of feasibility, and has equally bent the arc of medical rationality and global healthcare delivery away from unreflected on quick fixes. Yes, disease is never just one thing. There is no one size fits all. Straight-up technology delivery does not necessarily translate into patient care. Biology and technology interact in ways we cannot always predict. Health is biosocial through and through, and horizons are needed. The trick of the world, its secret and its truth, is that it is the fountain of all things. Paul's liberationist moral philosophy is set against extractivist economic models and breaks the grip of stagnant institutions on our imagination. It asks us to see others as creative agents of health, not just as problems or victims, and healthcare as a critical insurgency. Forcing us to think against the grain together, attentive to the non-teleological ways that sociomedical and political forces unfold in the field, and to care for the as-yet-unthought that keeps knowledge-making and response open to extemporization in constant recalibration. In other words, it calls for conceptual and political projects anchored on dignity and equity that continue to beckon us to intellectual work, solidarity, and practical commitments to justice, enlarging the sense of what is possible, especially when, at first, appears to be out of view. In the face of suffering, regardless of its cause, there is nonetheless relief and comfort from family, friends, and even strangers. And this happens after death as well. Paul wrote so lovingly and presciently, urging us to activate our horizoning capacity, as Adriana Petrina would say. As seas rise, glaciers melt, and forests burn, who among us isn't called to peer toward the horizon? And who among us, he ever so pushed, doesn't have to? These are Paul's living words. Like the direly needed seeds, the person, animal, spirit, plants, in this artwork, 
by the Amazonian indigenous artist Denilson Baniwa. For destruction is never absolute, and communities of desire persist in bringing healing to our riven earth. I'm Hans Saucy. I teach in the Department of East Asian Languages and Civilizations and the Committee on Social Thought at the University of Chicago. And my talk is called Paul Before Paul. It is incomprehensible the fact that someone can become something so quickly. I'll never forget the moment when what used to be my father arrived in an urn of fake marble. That's Paul Farmer speaking in 1985, from a letter I've been keeping, like all of his letters, through countless moves and life changes. Like all of you, I can't bear to see Paul turn into a thing. And one way of forestalling that is to make his words resound again. I had the astonishing good fortune to befriend Paul in 1978 or 79, and to keep up with him ever after. We exchanged a lot of letters, for the younger ones in the audience, a letter is a document often written by hand on paper and sent through an agency called the post office. Just wanted to make sure that was clear. Whether, we were in pres whether in presence or by letter, we were in a constant laser tag stream of jokes, questions, gossip, reflections, and grandiose plans. The number of books we, de we decided to write is uncountable. I don't want to claim excessive privileges from this long acquaintance, which I'm certainly not alone in having, but today it allows me to let Paul speak for himself from the time before he was Paul, so to speak. We're talking today about Paul's moral and intellectual legacy. Paul is a world historical figure, as Arthur put it this morning. Yes, we must. I think Paul really came into his own when PIH demonstrated first that MDRTB was infectious and could be cured, even in the poorest communities, and second, that HIV could be controlled, also in the poorest and least equipped communities, if only the necessary drugs were made available. These two victories, owed to many, but many who were inspired or led by Paul, solidified his position in global health and made his so-called idealism look like practical common sense. But I want to take you back to a time when Paul was not yet Paul, so to speak, when nobody knew about him and he had little but his own stubborn energy and commitment to go on. One of the characteristics that made him so endearing, and which many have mentioned today, was his ability to focus on the particular person in front of him not caring at all about whether that person was important or influential, since every person is important to him or herself, and he could adopt that perspective. One example, 1983, and Paul was back home from, uh, in Brooksville after a state stint in Haiti, recovering from malaria, as I learned later. But he found time to write me a succession of missives chronicling his erotic pursuit through the swamps of an elusive blue heron named Great Blue. A sort of comic allegory of one of our frequent topics of discussion, our ongoing late adolescent girlfriend problems. He wrote from Haiti uh, after a brief visit to Boston that he was relieved to be free of Jack Frost and his foliage-hating henchmen. That must have been in October. A month or so later, from Boston, I am going to Haiti in 19 days. Bam nouvelles en miou, for a site visit, as they say in development set jargon, and I wish it were for 19 years. I got to travel around Haiti with him, got to know and admire the great father Fritz Lafontaine, who was Paul's strongest local supporter, and saw for myself how completely dedicated he was to the place and to all Haitians. The Zomi friends, he mentioned, were some Haitian neighbors of mine in New Haven whose lives and extended family he never failed to inquire about. Some of the pictures you've seen this morning were taken by me in 1983, starring a gangly, grinning, excited Paul in his real country and in his element. 
I only wish I had taken more. In 1983, Haiti was still in the grip of the Duvalier kleptocracy, and we had to be careful what we said and to whom, because Baby Doc's informers and enforcers were everywhere. That changed in 1986 with the déchoucage, or eradication, of the Duvaliers. Paul wrote me, still celebrating about Haiti. Touch and go for a bit, as Père, that means Père Lafontaine, was missing for 10 days. Be caché net. He totally disappeared. Right? He resurfaced, quit the Maquis the day after the baby left. As you know, the ebullience didn't last. A junta took control and declared Paul persona non grata for several years, forcing him to remain unhappily the prisoner of Jack Frost and Harvard. Those were hard years for the clinic in Conge, years of intimidation and scarcity. Then came in 1994 the chance to go back. Paul's first act was to give the clinical staff time off. On Friday, it was my great pleasure to send the bulk of the medical staff two doctors and two nurses, home. No problem, I said. I can cover both the general and the women's clinic. The first couple of hours was fun, straightforward. Malaria, bronchitis, one case each of typhoid and TB, diarrheal disease, some dermatoses, impetigo, etc. But then came a tibial fracture. As you know, the x-ray machine is down, so I had to set it manually and cast it thanking all the while my ortho-tutor. Less than an hour ago, I delivered my first post tt baby. The harm done by those harsh years took time to repair. Merely repairing was never on Paul's agenda, though. I arrived to find no asthma meds, mine are gone now too, no metronazidol, no cipro, canamycin, no sterile saline solution, no catheters, and no morphine. Ringer's lactate is the only IV solution available. The women's health clinic is poorly stocked. The health crisis is unprecedented. Kaj has the only functional medical care in the entire central plateau. Three years ago, it was one of seven comparable institutions. From another letter. There are enough new cases of AIDS in the central plateau and enough horror stories to warrant the building of a small hospice. This is something Fritz and I had discussed last year, and it seems more than ever a noble idea. That noble idea led eventually to the provision of advanced therapies that brought HIV patients in the Conge Clinic back to life and health and proved the naysayers wrong. You know the story from then on. We are all grateful to Paul. Even if we were not his patients, he did cure us, many of us at least, of our depressions and hopelessness of the feelings and thoughts of futility and resignation that disarmed us before the injustices he wouldn't accept. It seems to me that he knew from the start, from his gangly, giggly start, what he needed to do. I was fortunate to have him for 43 years as my reality check, my moral compass, the person I could count on to read my messy drafts, the friend I could tell anything to. Every one of you, I know, can say something similar. Paul sometimes reminded me of his namesake, the Apostle Paul. You remember, the one who said that the wisdom of the world is folly in the eyes of God, and the folly of the inspired is the true wisdom. Surely it took more than a grain of folly or wisdom to fail to understand why patient people in Haitian villages should not expect the same quality of health care that the well-heeled denizens of Cambridge, Massachusetts expect. As Confucius said, I need two kinds of people, crazy ones and careful ones. Crazy ones to forge ahead, careful ones to avoid making mistakes. It's really there, Analects Book 13. Paul could be as careful as anyone, but his soul, if I may speak in such terms, was with the craziness. He loved defying passive acquiescence. Some of his more stinging phrases hang for me as brightly as warning comets in the sky. Managing inequality, socialized for scarcity, medical nihilism. And on the bright side, the hermeneutic of generosity, the preferential option for the poor, 
expert mercy. Paul's priorities were prisoners first, then patients, then students. You can analogize to fit your own sphere of action. I always try to do so. Thank you. My name is Vikram Patel. Uh, I was uh, recruited by Paul to join the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine just over five years ago. And I was told very recently that this was uh, over a bet that he took uh, with Arthur Kleinman. Um, <laughs> and apparently the big prize of the bet was a Chinese banquet. And this goes to show that Paul's moral and intellectual legacy that we've heard about so much so far could easily coexist with an incredible sense of humor. My whole life's work has been largely devoted to addressing, understanding and addressing mental health disparities, particularly in the country that I come from, India. If the numbers of us who will one day experience one of the conditions classed under the broad rubric of mental illness are substantial, and a majority of all families are likely to be affected, then the truly staggering number is how few in need will receive much in the way of help from professionals trained to provide it. This was the opening sentence that Paul wrote in the foreword to the second edition of my book, Where There Is No Psychiatrist, a volume whose first edition I wrote more than 20 years ago to support frontline workers in low-resource settings to support the recovery journeys of those in their own communities who were struggling with mental health problems. Some years after I joined Harvard, Paul and I wrote in The Lancet in a piece that we were arguing for a moral case to understand how the world should address mental health problems. We will need to reframe the appalling fact that most people with severe mental disorders and disabilities die earlier than they should simply because they do not have access to quality and person-centered care as a moral outrage no less an insult to our basic humanity than the arguments that people with HIV in Africa could be left to die because their country's health systems were weak or the interventions unaffordable. I remember these, these, these sentiments very well, having lived and worked in Zimbabwe in the mid-1990s, watching patients with HIV die under my watch in the psychiatric ward simply because they did not have access to medication that was already saving lives here in the US. He wrote, to do so, global health delivery practitioners will need to adopt a rights-based approach to healthcare. This approach demands that people with a lived experience must be at the center of decision-making about which interventions should be prioritized. Intervention should cover both the clinical and social aspects of the conditions, and they must be delivered with the full participation of the person affected. This has been really the essence of my own journey, using the tools of clinical, social, and implementation science, and in more recent years, invoking digital technologies to reimagine mental health care, particularly in India, but also in parts of sub-Saharan Africa. India is the country of my birth, where, where I've lived most of my life. And much of my work, as Paul did with PIH in various countries, uh, was done with a non-governmental organization called Sangat. At the heart of my work was to address the critical shortage and maldistribution of mental health professionals, not by asking for more medical schools and mental health professionals to move to these communities because I knew they never would, but by leveraging the resources that communities already had in their midst. Mostly, these were individuals who lived in those communities, who spoke the same language, who shared the same social world, and who had no intention of migrating anywhere else. In doing so, I was really building upon the very rich experiences of iconic figures in India and in Africa who had transformed healthcare from the ground up. Some of this work was documented in an amazing book that was a, was, a, was a huge inspiration for me, People's Health in People's Hands. But unknown to me, at the same time as I was beginning to actually work in this particular area, Paul Farmer and his organization, Partners in Health, were doing very similar work in other parts of the world. 
particularly focusing, of course, as we've heard earlier today, uh, on improving access to care for people with HIV and TB. When I did discover this, I was captivated by Paul's description of the role of the community health worker as accompanying a person on their journey to recovery. And I realized that much of what we do in the mental health space completely parallels this notion of accompaniment. Today, the very large and compelling body of implementation science that demonstrates the effectiveness of how people in the community, using resources in their own communities, can actually support the recovery of people with mental health problems, has laid the foundation of a transformed vision of mental health care. And I think what Paul implied is that in doing so, we flip the narrative that we hear so often of communities being under-resourced. Typically, that means they're under-resourced because they do not have enough hospitals and specialists. We flip that narrative by actually stating that every community has resources, people who care for one another, and it is our job to help those communities leverage and empower those resources. But it would be a mistake to consider accompaniment, as some people do, as a stopgap arrangement, as a band-aid, to tide communities over until we have enough hospitals and specialists. Because I believe, and I have seen through my own work, that when you receive care from someone who you identify with, who speaks your language, who you know you're going to see tomorrow, who shares the same social world, who sees you in your own home, who often integrates your mental health needs with your physical health needs and your other social health care needs, it invokes a very powerful current of social connectedness, which I think is almost impossible to replicate in the ivory towers of modern medicine. Moreover, this kind of care is much less likely to engender the kind of fear and shame that inf not so infrequently accompanies consultation with mental health professionals in big hospitals. And it empowers entire communities to take control of and address their own health needs. The essence, of course, of that book I mentioned earlier, People's Health in People's Hands. In conclusion, Paul wrote, uh, again, in the foreword uh, to, to my book, it is also true that some experiences in such settings, much of my work had been really coming from South Asia and, and Sub-Saharan Africa, but he wrote that much of what I wrote might plausibly inform the transformation of America's healthcare system. I have arrived in this country about six years ago, and I have been astonished to see so much need, unmet need, in a country that has so much. In some ways, it seems morally even more unacceptable than compared to the unmet needs that I witness in India and Africa. Indeed, the US spends more on mental health care than on virtually any other health condition, and enjoys more mental health resources per capita than any other country in the world. And yet, I think anyone who lives in this country will witness that we are watching a profound decline in all our mental health indicators, virtually every single metric. It's clear that money alone will not solve the problem. Global mental health, then, is a discipline that is quintessentially global, just as relevant in our own communities, in our own backyards in this country, as it is in the distant lands that often we practice global health in. As Paul wrote in his last sentence, it is the job of all of us to fight for the dignity of the afflicted. For me, that is the essence of accompaniment. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Alan Brandt. I'm a historian of medicine and public health and a longtime member of the faculty 
of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine. Um, I'm currently the interim chair of the department, Paul Farmer Chair, for more than the last decade. I first met Paul in, in 1984 as a first year medical student. Someone had told him, maybe you should read more about the history of medicine. And as became clear today, Paul was just the most voracious reader one could imagine. He came to see me in my office and we started a program of reading, and within weeks, certainly within a month or two, he was so far ahead of me. And when we think about flipping the narrative, Paul went so quickly from thinking of me as his teacher to my thinking of Paul as my teacher and mentor. And though Paul was young and a medical student and doing a thousand things and spending most of his weeks in Haiti, Paul became my mentor and my teacher, as he was for so many of us gathered here today in this room and many, many online. I learned so much from Paul, and like I think so many that he touched, um, he had a gigantic impact on me, both in terms of my career, but also personally. It's been a remarkable day here of remembrance and reflection about our beloved friend, Paul. I wanna thank all of you who have gathered here today. And I especially wanna thank the speakers. I've been to many memorial events filled with sadness and reflection, but quite frankly, I've never heard a series of talks and a series of reflections that have been so deeply moving and meaningful. And I know that's true for so many of you here. I want to thank Salman Khashavji and Marty Zeev for conceiving and planning this afternoon's symposium, which only enriched the beautiful and moving talks given this morning. Our speakers today, in both programs have captured Paul's brilliance, his genius, his intense moral vision, his fierce commitment to health and healing, his intolerance for social injustice, his strategic advocacy in support of health as a human right, and the fundamental basis for global health equity. Paul was so remarkable in so many ways, and. That's one of the things that I think we understand today, as so many people have pointed out, we'll never meet another Paul. But Paul, I think, today and in the future, his ideas, his commitment, his values, his brilliance will be very much with us. I realize today that Paul was so gentle and kind, but at the same time, so absolutely fiercely committed to justice and equity. And sometimes we think of those as contradictory qualities, this gentle kindness, this easy smile. But at the same time, Paul was steely in his determination to make a better world. He was a humble person, always sensitive to the needs of others. As many have explained, Paul's vision began with the interaction at the bedside with a patient in need of skill, treatment, and caring. Paul was a brilliant diagnostician in so many ways and a deeply caring physician. His analytic framework emerged from this encounter with an individual, a person in need. What accounted for their symptoms? How did they reflect the interactions of the biological and the social? How did the patient's suffering and illness reflect a deep social history of inequity, exploitation, and extraction? To heal the patient he understood would require the insights of social medicine if we were to fundamentally change the world that produces inequity and illness. 
Paul loved universities, and he knew how to leverage Harvard's identity and resources. He was absolutely committed to the idea that research, learning, and teaching must be a critical component of fundamental social change. In Paul's thinking, universities constituted an essential element in understanding and building a truly just and decent society. But his view is never uncritical. He understood that universities would never succeed as ivory towers. It was only in their engagement with the world's most difficult and important problems that they would ever have the kind of impact that they must. Students flocked, as many have observed, to these ideas and found motivation and inspiration in his teaching and in his transformative vision. Paul made us all better. He found value in our own work that we had often overlooked. This was certainly true for me. He had a way of always making the whole greater than the sum of its parts. For this reason, collaboration and deep and enduring partnerships were central to his vision. Our university and our department, typically and as it will be referred to as Paul's department, remains absolutely committed to maintaining and expanding his capacious moral and intellectual vision, a legacy of deep investigation and profound understanding, a legacy of innovation and creativity, a legacy of caring and commitment to global health equity through the preferential care of the poor, a legacy of building programs and institutions through connection and collaboration. Paul knew that only through these relationships could we instigate genuine change to repair the world. Paul drew us and thousands of others to his cause. He believed we could all contribute to this movement through our research, through deeply committed teaching and mentorship, through caring and service, through a commitment to enduring and dedicated accompaniment. He taught us that we must be there for one another. Today here at Harvard, and with the remarkable institutions that Paul built, partners in health, the University of Global Health Equity, the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and Women's Hospital, we all come here to rededicate ourselves to this mission. As difficult as it has been for so many of us to imagine the world without Paul, his teaching and his brilliant vision and example will continue to inspire us and motivate us in our efforts as it has in the past and it will in the future. This then is a time for us to honor Paul's memory by the work we do tomorrow in the days and years and decades ahead. Today's program will be just the first in a yearly series of symposia examining Paul's vision and scholarship with the goal of seeking new and innovative approaches to the highest quality care for all. We look forward to working with you to boldly advance this agenda, which must reflect the best application of what we discover and what we know and what we learn. As Paul taught us, we must produce not only biomedical innovations, but also research and understand how to deliver them to those most in need. Um, he understood and he supported the remarkable biomedical advances, but what we haven't been able to do and what we must is to figure out how to deliver them equitably and fairly and justly to populations around the world, especially those most in need. We come together today in sorrow, but with Paul's characteristic optimism and spirit to recommit ourselves to these goals 
which are at the center of our work, our medical school, our university. So again, I want to thank our wonderful speakers. Their, their, their vision and their hope and their ability to capture Paul's remarkable qualities, I have to say, has just meant so much to me today. I want to thank all of you who are here in person, those who are online. I want to thank President Bacow and his office and Dean Daly and all my friends and colleagues in the department, faculty, staff, and students who worked so hard to arrange today's programs. I especially want to mention Jennifer Puccetti, the executive director of our department, who worked with Paul decade after decade and accompanied him on so much of his work over this time. I so greatly miss Paul, but in the memories shared here today and the recognition of his writings, his vision, and his outstanding moral leadership and accomplishments, um, I think today we've all felt his presence. Paul had a remarkable energy and resilience, and he leaves a powerful legacy for justice and care. He left us a critically important set of instructions, as so many today pointed out, a detailed plan to guide our work in the future to repair the world. Sometimes it's said that people have a smile that can light up a room. Paul lit up the planet and showed us the way. Thank you very much. <laughs>